was a good boy. Gonna keep coming this way. Northwest of London, Ali is heading for an important consultation with one of the pioneering members of the Vet on the Hill team, orthopedic specialist Michael Hamilton. She's worried about her French bulldog Reggie, who's struggling to walk. Good boy. Reggie's been having some trouble with his hind legs for about two years. He walks like he's drunk, he's a bit wobbly, and when he's not walking, he starts sinking down. There's a good boy, Reg. Reggie's walk has declined rapidly in recent weeks, so she's hoping Michael can offer a solution. Hello, good morning. Hi. This must be Reggie. This is hey, Reggie. Reggie. How are you doing, my friend? Right, follow me. Come Let's on. look at these legs then. Come on, 97% of French Bulldogs have a spinal malformation. Luckily for most of them, it doesn't seem to affect them. Unfortunately for Reggie, he has a condition probably related to these malformations. Hello, my friend. How are you today? So, looking through his history, he's actually had previous spinal surgery elsewhere. Hasn't really made any odds. No. And he's actually gotten a little bit worse, is that? Yeah. Um, much... So, yeah, the last few months he's had sort of deteriorated a little bit more okay. and he's definitely losing some strength in his hind legs. Oh, really? Legs. Yeah. I noticed as he walked in, actually. Yeah, he's lost a lot of muscle, hasn't he, as well? Yeah. But I'll tell you what, those knees feel rock solid to me. They're not swollen at all. Right, quick fill of these hips, my friends. I'd say a normal range of hip motion. I think orthopedically he's actually all right. And um, a few little basic neuro tests here. If we just turn his paws over. Yeah, you see what he's doing with his feet there, Ali? He's sort of leaving his feet the wrong way up. That would imply there's something not quite right in his back somewhere. Normally, that's just straight back. So Ali, for me, uh, his problem is not orthopedic, it's neurological. He reminds me very much of my own dog, Bumble, who had a very complicated spinal problem that I ended up doing the surgery with one of my colleagues, Dr. Pete Smith, our senior neurosurgeon. I think we need to get Pete in on this one to have a look. Is that okay? That'd be great. Right, I'll go find Pete. We'd do anything for Reggie. He's so important, he means everything to the whole family. He's just one of the best little characters. That's a good boy. Hey. You're a brave boy. It's been a real concern because he's got a brother as well, Ronnie, and he can't run around with him. So I actually contacted a charity recently and they helped him provide some wheels. So that's helped him get to the park and back. So Ali, it's my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Pete Smith. He's a Hello. senior, he's a se se nice se you. senior neurosurgeon. So Pete, Reggie, for me, is also normal. Yeah. Neuro abnormal. Give me your thoughts, yeah. Morning, Reggie. That's just not working very well all the way up there. And there's one more reflex that I want to do, but I just need to pinch the skin along his back to see how he twitches in the way that we expect him to. It can just help us to be a bit more precise in working out where the problem resides. To me, he looks like a dog with a problem affecting the midsection of his spinal cord. So that region from sort of just behind his shoulder blades to the, just beyond the end of his rib cage. Given that he's orthopedically normal, I think we're going to need to do an MRI scan. So it's clear that Reggie's problem is a spinal one. It's not orthopedic, it's not bones and joints. What we need to do now is find out exactly where and what the spinal condition is. So for that, we need an MRI scan. Let's just get cracking. In London, Rourke and his team from Ark Animals Rescue are arriving at Scott's Richmond practice with some unusual patients. Hey, here to see Scott. Hi. What have we got there? Skunks. Skunks? Today we have three striped skunks who are here to be castrated and spayed. Hi guys. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm glad It's no smell. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> not yet, not yet. <laughs> right, so big day, yes. skunk neutering day. Yeah, I hope my nose is up for it. Luckily, I've got a really poor sense of smell. <laughs> Come on through, guys. What do you call a group of skunks? I don't know. <laughs> Smelly. <laughs> Come on in. All right, well, let's start with the girls then. Let's start with Daffy, shall we? Hi, beautiful. Pop it down there. Oh. Hello, you. You're very sweet, aren't you? 
So you got her since she was a, a real young baby? But yeah, we've raised it since she was about six weeks old. Wow. So I started Ark Animals back in 2015, uh, just as a general rescue, where I would adopt any exotic animal that needed help. Are you a little kit, were you? Hey. Uh, most places that will take wildlife won't give them many opportunities to keep going. If they don't think they can be released, they'll be put to sleep, whereas we will make sure they're comfortable and can live their life as full as they can. Right, so I just want to have a look at her underside. That's where we're looking at the danger zone. I won't put my face too close to that. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit, because I know that the, the scent glands are like anal glands in dogs, but um, they're a little bit more uh, weaponized. Yeah, shall we say? Absolutely. Yeah, they can produce quite a foul smell when they want to, um, but it will be a last resort for her, so it will be life or death. So that's why it's unlikely to happen today. However, I'm not sure they're going to do under anesthetic. Well, yes, it might be a little bit stressful. So the hope, I suppose, is that by neutering all of them, that they can actually then live together without the chance of the pitter patter of baby skunk yeah. feet. <laughs> there is a potential of that, but yeah. All right, well, should we have a look at one of the other ones then? Cool, should we get Missy out there? Yeah, please, yeah, lovely. Hello, oh wow, so uh, like a very different colour, like an almost an albino one. Nice strong heartbeats, all of them so far, so nice healthy animals. Good. Okay, let's just have a quick look at her tummy. Oh, you're so cute, aren't you? You're like a tiny little polar bear. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, again, I'm. You know, she's nice and healthy as well. So just a little bit more nervous. Yeah. So should we have a look at John? John the skunk. Okay, Hello, mate. Hello, mate. Hello, lad. Hello. He's more characterful. Yeah. Okay. Hello, champ. He definitely has got a, a waft. Is this a little warning of things to come, do you think? <laughs> it's the boys. The boys do have a smell of An odour. Girl. Okay. Well, that sounds like us as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me just have a little listen to him. Okay. For me, I'm happy to do uh, the new trings. That's not an issue. I think we're all a bit concerned about the smell. <laughs> um, but I'm sure it's going to be just fine. It'll be a very interesting day for all of us. Yeah. Right, you three, be good. <laughs> it's quite a long way down, and we're gonna have to take off quite a lot of the bone to get to the spinal canal itself. On the outskirts of London, surgeons Michael and Pete are informing Ali, her much beloved French bulldog Reggie, needs urgent spinal surgery. To me, he looks like a dog with a problem affecting the midsection of his spinal cord. Scans revealed important clues about Reggie's malformed spine. They sometimes get a little pocket of fluid sitting right next to the spinal cord, and it compresses the spinal cord, but it also disturbs the way spinal fluid flows over that area of damage, and, and that in itself has a knock-on effect to damage the spinal cord. I wouldn't feel happy if we didn't provide some extra stability at that area. The CD scan images were then sent off to create a high-tech 3D model, including crucial drill guides to be used as a vital reference during Reggie's surgery. The latest big innovation in, in, in surgery over the past few years has been 3D printing. We use a company called Vet3D, a chap called Bill Oxley, himself a very experienced spinal surgeon. We send the scans to Bill and what we've got made are these little prints that will fit onto Reggie's bones perfectly and so 3D printing has revolutionised our surgeries over the past few years. If the surgery goes wrong, it could leave Reggie completely paralysed. So how long will the surgery be? Is it quite complex? It's quite a delicate procedure. You're trying to basically recreate the channel that the fluid could flow a little bit more easily. Without surgery, the seven-year-old will almost certainly lose the ability to walk on his back legs quite anxious about the operation and he's not in any pain so the decision to have surgery is quite a difficult one um, because he is still mobile and he can get around so we'll keep all our fingers crossed that this surgery will be successful and he'll enjoy a good quality of life in a few weeks time. So Ali, I mean we're, we're in agreement so, let's, so let, let's, just, let, let's just get cracking I think. Okay, you be brave boy. Good boy. With Ali 
he's part of the family, isn't he? And just watching the way she was looking at him, I mean, it, it melts your heart every time. But this condition for Reggie is becoming progressive. Good boy. Right, year three, be good. In London, Scott is bracing himself for a close encounter with three potentially very smelly skunks. Hey, Nath. Nice. Oh, How hey, Scott. Skunk delivery. Wow, okay. <laughs> this is new. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's new for me as well. Um, I've never done uh, a neutering of a skunk before. Have you done an anaesthetic on a skunk before? Not a skunk. No, I don't see many of these. No. <laughs> yeah, rightly so. Like, we got a, quite a bit of warning about the potential smell. Skunk spray is a noxious liquid they project from under their tail when they feel threatened. Apparently there's three different types. They do a sort of fart, they do a warning shot, and then they give you the full Monty, which right. is... Um, sort of this jettison of disgusting smell that smells like a mixture of dead bodies and garbage. I've got to get the train home later, <laughs> just, to, just to let you know. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Male skunk John will be first, and even though he'll be anaesthetised, Scott and Nathan are worried they could be in the firing line. OK, so we're going to neuter this boy. <sighs> oh. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> you just let it go. Oh my god, that's really in the back of my throat. Oh, I suppose I am taking his balls off. <coughs> oh my god, that is horrific. So I suppose in his mind I'm attacking him in his male part area and he's not appreciating it, which is fair enough. But he will get to hang out more with the girls when this is done, so it's for your own good. A whole. <coughs> oh, God. oh, there should be a law against that. That is nasty. Over my 25 years, I've done many smelly in operation. Um, this is up there, definitely on the podium, I would say, for stinkiest procedure but it is a skunk so what was I to expect you know <laughs> right oh goodness me I need to go and get some fresh air who's oh, sleeping boy. in the shed tonight then oh, <laughs> oh god it seems a good <clears throat> I need a good gargle <laughs> and a good shower <laughs> lucky Scott he gets to do two more skunk surgeries and who knows what might happen Good girl. Who's your sister? Hmm? So that was pretty stinky. Because of the nature of what we're doing to Reggie, the risks are much greater than normal. Northwest of London, neurosurgeon Pete and orthopaedic surgeon Michael are about to begin high risk spinal surgery on French bulldog Reggie. Whenever you're operating next to the spinal cord, you can end up paralysing the patient. With any spinal surgery, there's a risk of spinal cord contusion, risk of major blood vessel rupture. And another complicating factor in Reggie is that because his bones are slightly misshapen, there's nothing regular about it. With an injury to the spinal cord, like we have in Reggie's case, there's going to be some permanent damage. So he's not going to walk normally from this. But he's a dog who's been getting progressively worse over recent weeks. And the first aim is to get him through this procedure and to stop the problem from getting worse. Reggie's wonky spine has been replicated in a high-tech 3D printed model, which the surgeons will reference to help them accurately place drill holes directly into the spine. This dog's spinal cord is getting compressed by what's called a, um, a subarachnoid diverticulum. That means there's accumulation of fluid, like a cyst, around the membrane, right around the spinal cord, and that buildup of fluid squashing the spinal cord. So we've got to unsquash the spinal cord. So you can see that on the MRI scan here, that is the spinal cord. That little white bit around is the cyst. So that fluid's got nowhere to go. And then because of that, it's messing with just the fluid dynamics completely. This is fiddly. The location of the cyst means Pete must remove a large amount of bone to get to the damaged part of Reggie's spine. 
quite a chunky dog, which means he's got a lot of muscle. He's not a young chap. The surgeons will then insert stabilizing screws, remove the roof of the spinal canal, then remove the cyst, before encasing the screws in bone cement to stabilize the surgical site. We can see the tops of these bones here now, and the lungs are just through there. It's high risk by definition, you know, we're operating on the spinal cord. We're going to be putting screws in the bones and on the other side of those bones are the lungs and some big blood vessels. There is a chance of significant complications and potentially mortality on the table. It can go horribly wrong very quickly at multiple steps. Apart from that, it should be fine now. Apart from that, I mean, it's a walk in the park. Do you think of Polly? She's good. You love her, don't you? In the north of England, Karen and her grandson Ethan have come to see new Vet on the Hill member Louisa, as they're worried about their seven-month-old Shih Tzu, Polly. In the last three days, she's been quite poorly. With sickness and diarrhea, but she got quite severe. Ethan and I have been up since half past four this morning with her, cleaning and cuddling and making her feel better, but we're quite concerned about her now. It's Polly, please. Come on. Come on, Polly. So Polly's been rushed down to us. Her owner's really worried because she has had vomiting and diarrhoea and she's passing a lot of blood from her back end. She's only seven months old, so she's really, really worried that there's something quite nasty going on. She's an eater. She's yeah, an eater. She's been a bit poison. She just eats leaves, okay. bare flowers. So she eats things that she shouldn't do? She certainly does. She looks pretty miserable, doesn't she? She's a little bit pale there, isn't she? Ethan, do you help me? Yeah, okay, so what I need you to do is, I need you to stroke her ears. I need you to stroke her ears, that's it. That's it. Because I think seeing you makes her feel better. She's had a poo on her little black. So the poo looked black? Little bits. Okay. She was bleeding yesterday. Yeah, so she's had yeah. bloody poo as well. Yeah. Okay, so what that could be, is that she has got some blood somewhere in her guts and when the blood gets digested it looks like coffee grounds. It's always really worrying when you've got any pet that's passing blood in their vomit or faeces but when you've got a younger dog potentially this could be a nasty viral infection, something like parvovirus which we know is life-threatening. They can have a really really nasty hemorrhagic gastroenteritis or she's got a parasite infection or that she swallowed something that's stuck and she's actually got a blockage. So what I'm going to recommend that we do, we keep Polly in with us, we'll do a blood test just to check her general health and then I think I would like to do an ultrasound scan of her tummy and just yeah. check that there's nothing going on in there yeah. that we could maybe quickly fix. So she's sleeping in tonight? So this is an animal hospital where we're going to try and make her feel a little bit better. Polly's owners are really, really lovely. Um, she's only seven months old and they've got a really, really lovely bond with her and you can see that they're so worried that they're going to lose her so it's really important that we really try and find out what's going on with her so we can fix her. So what we'll do is we're going to keep her in with me and we're going to give you a call in a couple of hours. Bye. See you in a couple of days. Thank you, Zach. I don't want to go. It's okay, I'll look after Ethan, I promise. You're welcome. I'm going to look after her, okay? Thank you. You go, and have a, you go and have a nice day, okay? Bye. 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 That feels... Not too bad. I think you know, mate. I think that feels pretty good. Just outside London, Pete and Michael have finally reached the area of French Bulldog Reggie's spine they need to stabilise. This is where the 3D printed model and importantly the 3D drill guides for Reggie's spine will play a vital role. Here's this dog's spine. These bones should all look fairly kind of uniform like little bricks. The bones here are grossly deformed. The 3D model with its pinpoint accurate hole placement is a crucial guide as they drill into Reggie's backbone and insert screws to make his damaged spine more rigid. That thing there is going to clip onto this bone here and it sits absolutely perfectly and through the guides we can 
drill a hole, and then in that little hole, we're gonna then put screws. Through the walls of that canal, perfect. So what we've done is just strip away all the tenderness and ligament attachments to these bones here, so they're quite nice and shiny, so the guide can sit quite neatly on there. That's in exactly the right position, and we should now be able to drill the holes and be certain that they're in exactly the right place. It's so vital to make sure that these things fit perfectly, because if they wobbles a little bit, you could potentially stick the drill in the spinal cord, and that's game over. Right, mate, can you pull it? Okay. Yeah, go. Ready? Yeah. Michael and Pete take turns drilling the holes for the eight screws that will go into Reggie's spine. Very dense this one, isn't it? One false move could prove fatal. Even if we've got the guide in the perfect position, that only tells us where to start drilling from. If we just put a load of pressure on, we're just gonna go straight through into the chest. If we go too far, we could easily hit one of the major blood vessels running underneath the spine. Can you put your thumb, do you think? Yeah. Stop, stop. It's either out or it's not quite perfect. Either way. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you're not, we're not, you can't really redrill it, do you know what I mean? She's had four days of vomiting and diarrhea and she can't keep any water down. So. If we can do some bloods first. In Yorkshire, Louisa urgently needs to find out what's making Shih Tzu puppy Polly extremely ill. So you can see that she's really quite lethargic. She's seven months old, so she should normally be quite active and silly and being a puppy. And the fact that she can't keep water down, you know, they can dehydrate really quickly. So it's really important that we get her in, get her on some fluids and have a look, see if we can find what's going on. She's more flat than I thought. Can you see it raising at all? So we're actually just struggling to even see a vein where to take bloods from because she's she is dehydrated. It's okay. Taking blood is actually really tricky today because she's so dehydrated that her veins are collapsed. So I'm actually struggling to find the veins where we normally take them from. It must be in that groove there. Goes to show how poorly she is that I can't see this vein. Okay, I think works. Let's do a leg. Louisa and Nurse Nikki are now attempting to take blood from the desperately ill puppy's leg. It's good news that we've taken some bloods now from Polly and we're getting her on a drip so we can put lots of fluids into her system and sort of rehydrate her and make her feel a little bit better. So once we've done that, I'll check the bloods and we'll make a plan and see where we go from here. The blood results are supporting the fact that she's showing she's dehydrated, so her red blood cell count looks like it's really high, but it's a sign of dehydration. And her white blood cell count is super high, so she's obviously got some sort of infection or inflammatory process going on that's making her feel really poorly. She is only seven months old and she's obviously got something nasty going on, so we need to try and find the source of this infection or inflammatory response that's going on so we can try and fix it, which is why we're going to do the ultrasound scan next. Okay. Here, this is all bits of intestine that are all really inflamed. I mean, even that's not nice, does yeah. it? It's no wonder little Polly is so sick. She's actually been not only pooing blood, but she's been pooing dark blood, so it's, it might be that actually she's bleeding from her intestines. Oh, sorry, Treasure. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm being really gentle, really gentle. So we've got one more to go. So this is the last one. All right, ready? Yeah. 50 kilometres from London, Michael and Pete have almost finished drilling holes into the wall of Reggie's deformed spine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, just absolutely perfect. Now they'll place screws into the holes as they attempt to correct a debilitating condition that would have left the seven-year-old French bulldog unable to walk. 
So we're fusing kind of four bones together over the space of three discs. So this is the first screw going in. The biggest risk is placing the screws in a perfect position. This goes off target and maybe fractures the bone or worst case, you go the wrong way the other side to get in the spinal cord and that is, that's bad, bad, bad news. That's a paralysed dog right there. Thankfully, all eight screws are inserted safely. Be perfect. Reggie has survived the most dangerous part of the operation. This, it's unusual to do surgeries this long, but in his case, it's always going to be difficult and very time consuming. As Pete begins cutting off the roof of the spinal canal, surgery has already been going for several hours. You have no choice. Once you've started, you're committed to finishing, but sometimes you have to drink and that was like the best drink you'll ever have. It's like that cold beer on a hot sunny day. Perfect. If you loosen it and hold it, I'll sort of move my head a little bit. With the roof of the spinal canal removed, Pete uses a magnifying headset to help cut out the troublesome cyst blocking the flow of Reggie's spinal fluid. This is very much a kind of a neurosurgeon thing. Hence he's got the ophthalmic kit. So. It's all been geared towards this moment up until now. And as he incises through the outer membrane of the spinal cord into the cyst, if it's under pressure, you might get a little spurt of fluid. So you've got an intricate meshwork of fibres that are normally here. I think in Reggie's case, unfortunately, the scarring, and that's what we're trying to just break down so that the fluid can start flowing more normally across this area and his spinal cord can hopefully start to recover a little bit. That's gold, man. That's hard to get. OK. Pete has finally removed the damaging material that had all but paralysed Reggie's back legs. So we're in the home straight now, so that stuff there that Pete's just shoved in. So he delicately inserted. <laughs> that little bit of stuff that Pete delicately shoved in there. You lay it over, and remember it, it will hopefully reform the dura, sealing the spinal fluids. We're pretty happy at this point. Pete's done a cracking job. So now I've just got to connect these screws together with bone cement, close them up, get into CT, and then we'll really see are those screws as perfect as we think they are. It's the moment of truth. If the CT scan shows the screws are not where they should be, little Reggie could be paralyzed. We've done all we can. And then it's just, um, fingers crossed, the moment of truth. Oh. Oh my God. He just let it go. In London, Scott is still reeling after copping a blast of very smelly male skunk spray during neutering surgery. Oh my God, it's really in the back of my throat. So he's understandably wary about two more skunks, girls this time, that also need spaying. Come on, come on, let go. There we go, there she is. <laughs> hey, yeah, so cute, aren't you? <laughs> so, like, skunk nappy at the ready. <laughs> Scott's hoping his inventive new line of defence will save him from further skunk attack. If we just kind of wrap a bum in that, then I'm kind of covering the danger zone. What do you think? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you okay. want to go for it? I think let's go for it. Good girl. Daffy is the first girl. Too bad, hey? And thankfully, she's very ladylike. Thank you for not sharing your scent with us. We appreciate that. Okay. And Sister Missy... Yeah. ...is equally well behaved. Surgery's gone well, so... Happy vet. 
Lovely. Right. Two hours later, Rourke and his team are back to collect the patients. Hi guys. Hey. Uh, Here you go. It's John. <laughs> Stinky John. Oh, he really took my breath away. Seriously, <laughs> Did it? took my breath away. Oh yeah. <laughs> they were really very, very good patients. The girls were very well behaved um, and surgery went without a hitch. We did John and as I was uh, castrating him, he decided to, to let off. Um, I was not prepared. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm still clearing my throat a little bit, but I was taking away his testicles. So he was uh, mounting a, a dirty protest, but no, no skunk babies. Hopefully at some <laughs> point they'll be able to enjoy each other's company. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, so it's gone, it's gone all very well, really. Well, thank you so yeah. much for doing it. Oh, you're so welcome. Are the windows open the way home? Yeah, <laughs> windows open, I think for sure, yeah. is definitely the, the, the travel of choice. Yeah, oh, thank you so you're much. You're welcome. All right, bye guys. Take thank care, you. Guys. Bye. You bye. Waft, take it with you. Why don't you go? No, no, yeah, no, see you no, later. no, no. Oh, you just stand outside until it airs off. <laughs> this is the bit of being an orthopedic surgeon or spinal surgeon that makes you feel sick and gives you grey hairs. Plenty of these. Northwest of London, it's a tense wait. As Michael and Pete prepare to view CT images of the spinal surgery on French Bulldog Reggie. It's only just loading up. But there's always that element of doubt, yeah. isn't there? The question yeah. mark until you see. There's tension in the air when you're waiting for the results of a CT scan. If we've got a screw in the wrong place, that could be chronic pain for Reggie if it's affecting a nerve root. It could be paralysis. This is his spine and these are the ribs coming off here. So the screws that we put in are all here. So man, there's a the first screw head, second two, screw yeah. heads are anchors. Safe. Trajectory's good. Oh, perfect. Oh. Okay, I can live with that one. Absolutely bang on. And the last, last one. one. Oh, look at that. <laughs> good work. Nice one, mate. Love that, love that. That is no perfect, way. that is no perfect. Way. We're fine. From a surgeon's perspective, this makes us feel good. These screws are absolutely perfect. Everyone perfect. So this is a very satisfying moment for us. Oh, yes. <laughs> but as pleased as Michael and Pete are with the results of the marathon surgery, until Reggie recovers, they can't be certain he'll ever walk again. It's just nice to know that we've done all we can. It might be that actually she's bleeding from her intestines. In North Yorkshire, Louisa is performing an ultrasound scan on seven-month-old Polly to find out why the young puppy is suffering from a potentially fatal bout of diarrhea. Is it just all just poo, 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 bow, bow, bow? Poor Polly is suffering a severe case of gastroenteritis, and unless it's treated quickly, it can be deadly. I've seen particularly young dogs that get hemorrhagic gastroenteritis become really dehydrated and they essentially just poo fluid and blood. Um, sometimes they die. So this is the stomach. It is just really, really full of liquid and little bits of old food. It shouldn't be that much full of food when she's had vomiting and diarrhea, so she's not really been eating anything. Just lie there. I know, I know. All of her intestines are really, really quite poorly. They're dilated, they're full of fluid when they should be all collapsed and empty because she's not been eating. So now we're gonna try and see if there's any obstruction so there's nothing stuck somewhere that would require us to go straight to surgery. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back and try and see if there's anything else that we can see, otherwise we'll just treat her for a nasty bout of gastroenteritis. So I can't see any obstruction, so I can't see a foreign body. So we'll treat her for a nasty hemorrhagic gastroenteritis sort of thing. Hope that she feels better. All right, sweetheart. Oh, sweetheart. I feel like it's good news that we've not seen an obvious obstruction, so that's positive. But I'm still feeling a bit worried that even these gastroenteritis cases in a young dog, they can still be potentially quite life-threatening. 
So we're just drawing up some antibiotics. I'm going to do two types of antibiotics to attack two different types of bugs. I don't know what's making her so sick, but I'm going to try and attack it from both sides based on how she looks, her blood test and the ultrasound scan. If she can have that metronidazole slow IV. Polly will stay overnight on an IV drip to replace desperately needed fluids. Louise is confident her little patient will make a full recovery. Good girl. Come on, there's a good boy. On the outskirts of London, it's been five days since Reggie's spinal surgery. It's time for Michael to reunite anxious owner Ali with her beloved French bulldog. It's been a really long week while Reggie's been kept at the surgery for his recuperation. We've really missed him. So looking forward to getting him home, but it does come with some apprehension because obviously there's still quite a long way for Reggie to, to go yet. Morning, Ali. Hi. How are you doing? Good, thank you. I've got somebody who's looking forward to seeing you. Thanks. Because of the scarring, Reggie's worse than he was before the surgery, but he's making small daily improvements. But if he's any better than he was, that would be a massive win, given how bad his condition was. Right, come on in. Here he is. Hey, baby. Here he is. Hello. Hello, love. What are you doing? <laughs> Hey. Oh, I love you, Baba. He's been an absolute pleasure to have him. Everybody's totally fallen in love with him. You gonna miss us? He's so good. He's like, no, <laughs> he's like, it's too early for me. The surgery went really well. Hopefully, in a couple of weeks, he's gonna be walking. The whole point of this procedure, in most cases, is they just don't get worse. Yeah. We're a bit more optimistic than that. We've got high hopes for him. We hope he's going to improve back to where he was and then kick on again and be even better than he was. So he's just going to get stronger and stronger. Yeah. He's still not fully walking yet, so that's going to take a little bit of work. But I'm so happy at this moment that we did go ahead with the surgery for Reggie. So as long as he can come home and he's walking, then I think we've made the right decision. As long as he's not painful and he's happy and he can get around and have a nice life with you, that's, that's what it's all about. So, Reggie, are you listening? You, are you listening now? Yes? Okay, yeah, you're listening, right. Here's the plan. You're going you're gonna to go home. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You're going to go home and you're going to stop walking on those legs. You're going to do lots and lots of exercises, stack a load of muscle on, and you're going to run in to see us in a few weeks' time. You got that? Oh, we're going to miss you, mate. Honestly. Oh, sorry, <laughs> slipped. From a personal perspective, the reason that we do this job is, is to help animals and their owners. Let's go, my little man. There we go. It's clear what Reggie means to Ali, and if we can give her her dog back in a better state, and he has a lovely old life with her, that's what it's all about for us. Good boy. <laughs> there he goes. Good boy, Reg. Go, Reg. Oh, you're doing so well. A few days later, Louisa's little gastro patient Polly is now back to her old self, with no more worrying vomiting and diarrhoea. The young Shih Tzu is now full of energy and enjoying playtime. This way, Reg. And against all odds, little French bulldog Reggie has made an amazing recovery. Good boy. The little battler continues to thrive after undergoing complex surgery to repair his damaged spine and his future certainly looks brighter. I'm so surprised by how well Reggie's now walking. He's fully coordinated, he's got so much strength and I just see him improving week on week. Good boy. Reggie has gone back to being naughty, so that must mean he's feeling so much better. <laughs> At Scott's London practice, Leslie has arrived, worried about foster dog Chalky. Yes. Leslie is a volunteer with dogs on the street, and as soon as Chalky arrived at the sanctuary, she noticed he needed urgent medical attention. Hi, Leslie. Hello. Hi, you must be Chalky. Hello, handsome boy. How you doing? But this handsome boy is carrying around a big problem. Oh my gosh. 
What is this? Chalky has a large growth on the side of his body. What is that, buddy? Wow, he has a whopping great mass on his sides that are hanging down. He's a white dog, but he looks a little bit like a cow with some udders full of milk. That is absolutely massive. It is, never seen anything like it. Oh my gosh. All right, well, should we get you into the concert yep. room and have a better look? Okay. Yeah? Come on in, handsome boy. Come on in, come this way. Come on, good boy. Good boy, come this way. In Chalky's case, his dad was offered some temporary accommodation, but unfortunately, it didn't allow for pets. So sadly, Chalky couldn't go along with his dad. Thank goodness, Dot Sanctuary was there to take him in. Hey, yes. Oh, you're such a nice boy. It just shows he's such a love dog. He is. He's clearly very, very well cared for. Yeah. Yeah. For many of the vulnerable people that, that Dot's looks after, mm -hmm they've got far bigger challenges. So Absolutely. Chalky is happy yeah. and healthy and yeah. he's eating well. He's yeah. like, oh, well, it's just a lump. There's nothing to worry about. Yeah. Uh, but it's great that he's come to you yeah. guys because that's a whopper. It obviously does need to be looked at because I've never seen anything like that before. So how long do we think it's been there for? Do we have any idea? I really don't know. He's been with us for a couple of weeks now and he, he came in like that. So right. I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm assuming a long time because it's huge. Um, and I'm hoping it's nothing too serious. Here we go. So if you were just holding his head for me, that's it. Let's just have a really good feel of this. Very warm, obviously very vascular. I'm sure you won't mind missing that, will you? Huh? So we can focus on the handsome bit and <laughs> not the less handsome. He is very handsome. You are a handsome boy, aren't you? Yeah. This lump really is quite shocking. This mass has grown absolutely massive. It's very vascular, it's very heavy, and it will be causing some discomfort as it stretches some of his abdominal muscles away from his body. Thankfully, I can get my fingers underneath. It is attached to musculature, mm -hmm. uh, otherwise it'd be on the floor. Um, so it is attached, so I will have to cut through a little bit of muscle to get rid of it, but I know that I'll be able to get good margin here, so even if this is something that's of concern, I'd be hopeful that we'll be able to give him cure by performing surgery. There's two reasons really why we should be removing Chalky's tumour. First of all, it is massive and unpleasant and will be causing some discomfort. But there's also the chance that when a tumour grows to a certain size or grows quickly, it could be a sign of cancer. How do you feel? I mean, I think it is the right thing to remove oh, this lump. But I do think that we should send off this mass and hopefully it's you know, not more bad news for this gentleman yeah. and instead it'll be a clear bill of health to weight off daddy's mind yeah. and a weight off your body. Hey, yes, yes, does that sound good? It will be very interesting to find out you know, whether it's just benign, whether there's a little bit more to it. Fingers crossed it's nothing more, but he's in the best place, he really is. Do you want to so give him a little boy. kiss, good boy? Hey. Kiss him, boy. Yeah, good boy. No. I know. He's gonna be good boy. Come on, Jazz. Let's get you to the vets. In southwest London, Sarah is on her way to see Vet on the Hill newcomer Michael, with a tiny patient he's come to know well in recent months. I've got Sarah coming in today with her guinea pig Jasper who has what we think is an infection behind the eye, which is actually pushing the eye out of the socket. It's gonna be okay. Good boy. Well done, little man. We woke up suddenly overnight to see that his eye was just looking really, really bad, just awful. It was a dramatic, shocking change. Hi, Sarah. How are you doing? Hey, Michael. I think we really need to get him in and see what we're doing about this eye. Yes, yeah, so the eye's not doing well then. No, it's looking really horrific. Oh, Jasper. Right, yeah. let's have a look. Come on through. Thank you. We got Jasper as a rescue guinea pig, abandoned out of his litter because he'd been bullied and picked on by all the other guinea pigs. And we just took him home and he's been part of the family ever since. He sits out on the sofa with us in the evening looking at things on the TV and he's just fun. He's been part of treasure hunts, he's gone on holiday with us and, you know, he's just this amazing part of the family. Oh, Jasper. Oh my God, Jasper, look at that eye. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's really horrific. I had to explain to the kids so they didn't just look at him and freak out and we sort of call it his zombie eye. 
I mean, and I, I can even... this is the, some of the you gunk. see that? Oh, you can touch it. I can even he... touch it. He's not responding. No, nothing. All the nerve endings, everything is just completely cut off. Yeah. I'm a bit shocked. I just see this big, hard, dry eye sticking out the socket. And I'm just thinking, my God, that must be painful. That's not good. The most likely cause of this eye being pushed out is yeah, yeah. something called a retrobulbar abscess. Right. And this is when infection develops behind the eye. Oh, it forms a pussy abscess and that pushes the eye out oh, the socket. My dude. The difficult thing is that it rarely responds to antibiotics. We can operate. It means taking out the eye. Obviously he can manage, you know, I have a one-eyed cat, Otto, who you see over there, and oh, he is Otto. perfectly fine with one eye, so I think his quality of life will be much better without the eye. But Sarah is concerned about surgery. Just two months earlier, Michael operated on Jasper's teeth. She's worried another general anaesthetic might be too much for the five-year-old guinea pig. Oh, Jasper, it's all right. We're going to make it better, mate. Good boy. Over the last few weeks, I've been spending quite a bit of time talking to the kids about uh, Jasper and how he's gone downhill quite a lot. They know that Jasper might not get through today, but we don't want to give up on him just yet. So I think the best thing that we can do today just to see how serious it is, is to take an x-ray of his skull. Hopefully if everything goes well with the anaesthetic, the nucleation, then he'll be a much happier guinea pig. I'm about 90% confident that what we're dealing with, with Jasper, is a retrobulbar abscess. But until we take that x-ray, we can't actually confirm what we're dealing with. It could be something like a cancerous mass. You don't really know. Right, Jazzy, you'd be super good, OK? We'll see you later. You got through the general for your teeth, so you can get through the general for this, OK? I told you he loves this basil. And you'll be back in the garden before you know it. And be good, okay? We'll see you in a little bit. Good boy. Okay, buddy. Right, we'll see you later. Kerman boy. There we go. So this is Chalky. Very, very handsome Chalky until you get round to this side. <laughs> yeah. That. What is that? Uh, yet to find out. It's a very, very heavy lump, isn't it, buddy? That's got to go. At Scott's London Clinic, Scott and vet nurse Joe are about to begin surgery to remove a massive lump from foster dog Chalky. All right, so have we got a little muzzle that we can put on our champion? Because Chalky is a little bit nervous, a bit anxious, we just need to change the way that we work to suit him. Good boy. Okay. Oh, it's my okay. goodness. If you don't remove tumours like this, they can have the tendency to spread, particularly when they get large. They can spread to other parts of the body, and of course, they can be fatal. Yeah, so I mean, I'm hoping it's not gonna be anything serious, but you just can never tell, and clearly something that's grown this big has got a good amount of blood supply, so mm, I just hope it's not more bad news for your daddy, eh? The size of that blood vessel there. Straight down into the mass. Getting Chalky prepared for surgery, the one thing is very obvious, there are some huge blood vessels supplying this tumour. It's very vascular, and unfortunately this surgery is going to be very bloody. All right, Joe, are you happy? Mm -hmm. Yep? Yeah. All right. I have a feeling this is going to be very satisfying. I know, yeah, I agree. You know? Yes, I agree. Yeah. Everyone wants the weight off their shoulders or side, as the case <laughs> may be here. Scott will be using an electro cautery machine to stem the bleeding as he cuts. The absolute whopping blood vessels. <laughs> using electro cautery means that electrical impulses then help to clot blood and stop blood vessels from pumping out more blood. So it's a great way to be able to cut and cauterize it at the same time. I might just need a towel on the floor, Joe, because there's fountains everywhere. I was expecting a decent amount of blood, but when I first cut through the skin with the electrocardium machine, there's some real spurters there. It's like fountains of blood. So you have to react quickly. You can't get intimidated by all the blood, but there is a decent volume coming out. Yeah, so uh, for it to get this big, it had to have a big blood supply. That was not a surprise. Uh, but uh, you know, yeah, it is quite a bloody surgery, just simply because you have to find each blood vessel and isolate it, and that's not always possible, so I'm gonna have to 
cut first and then stem the tide later. Being that there's a lot of bleeding associated with this very large tumor, I really need to work extra quickly to get it out, but then be able to see all the blood vessels that need tying off and cauterizing. Basically cut the underside uh, to be able to expose all these blood vessels and then ligate them. And now I'm gonna cut the top. So yes, okay. I think that'll fit, yep. So I think the best thing that we can do today just to see how serious it is, is to take an x-ray of his skull. In southwest London, Michael needs to anaesthetize guinea pig Jasper so he can x-ray him and assess the severity of his dysfunctional left eye. Quick pinch. So with guinea pigs, anaesthetics are always a risk. They're just a lot more delicate. So sometimes the drugs that we use can just hit them a bit hard. So during the actual procedure, there's always the risk that they might just pass away. I think he's sleepy enough now, so let's take him through and get that x-ray. He's completely zonked. Hey, let's go. There we go, good boy. Okay, let's get this x-ray. There we go. This isn't good. Jasper has really bad dental disease. These molars here, which are in the skull, are meant to be nice and straight. In his case, because they weren't growing properly. This tooth here, this root, is right beneath where his eye socket is. And that's why we've now got this infection, this retrobulbar abscess, which is pushing the eye out of its socket. With his diagnosis confirmed, Michael and Nurse Lucy proceed with surgery to remove the dangerously infected eye. So what I'm going to do is try and get the eye out without rupturing it. So that's a very delicate process and I have to be quite careful and slow, making sure that I don't rupture any big vessels. If I do rupture a big vessel, there'll be a lot of bleeding and it's very difficult to actually stop that. It is so gory and gruesome. You know, you're literally cutting out an eye from the socket. There's blood, there's going to be pus. And in a guinea pig Jasper's size, I can't afford to lose any blood. That can be a death sentence. You happy with how everything's going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Nice and stable. That's the best we can wish for. If the drugs are too strong, then basically that can affect the heart, and if the heart rate's too low, that can be life-threatening for them. Doing an anaesthetic on any small animal, my stress levels go through the roof. If it does look like there's a possibility that he could wake up, that can increase his anaesthetic agent or there's other drugs we can give. It's just important to make sure that we're monitoring them constantly and start to finish. A lot can go wrong at this stage. It is a high risk situation and we can't assume that he will come out alive the other end. As you can see here, I've cut away all the tissue that's holding the eyeball in a socket. There's just a tiny bit left here, so I'm at the point of detaching the eye. Oh, there's a bit of pain there, so there's a nerve. I've cut the underside uh, to be able to expose all these blood vessels and then ligate them, and now I'm gonna cut the top. So yes, I think that'll fit, yep. At Scott's London practice, it's the moment of truth for Chalky. You ready? Scott is finally about to remove a massive tumour on the side of the foster dog's body. Like a fountain at Caesar's Palace. Oh my gosh. There we go. Removing a mass of this size is always going to throw up some challenges, with the main one being the size of the wound that's left once you've taken it away. And the big thing you need to remember is to always check that you can actually close the wound that you've created. So at the moment it looks like a huge gaping hole, and it is, but the mass itself by hanging off Chalky's body for so long has actually stretched the skin, so there's quite a lot of extra to, to go around and close this deficit. Close your time. It's been a messy, challenging surgery, but as Scott begins to close, he's feeling positive about Chalky's outcome. I'm happy that the surgery has come with a big margin, so difference between healthy and not healthy tissue. There's a, a lot of 
a lot of space between those two things. So I'd be hopeful that even if this tumour does come back as something nasty, Chalky should hopefully be a-okay. The positive I can take out of it is that Chalky has very good blood pressure, so that's good. <laughs> the amount of floor cleaning that Joe has to do, less good. <laughs> Definitely less good. <laughs> By the end of the closure, I'm actually really satisfied how this wound looks. I mean, to remember how big that tumour was and then how large the wound was left after I've removed it, now all he has is a lovely little smile on his side. Looks nice. Looks nice. He's got a waist again. Ready for the summer. While Chalky wakes up in recovery... Good boy, have a little snooze. Hey, and we'll call Leslie, eh? Hey? Scott will weigh the tumour and take a sample to send off for testing. 400 grams, so it's still a significant weight off this dog. Although I'm very satisfied that I've removed the mass entirely and given margins, which is kind of the separation between healthy tissue and unhealthy tissue, I feel in this case that by sending it off to the lab, we'll be very sure about exactly what the cause of this growth is and let's hope it's not cancer, but even if it is, fingers crossed by removing it the way I have, it will give full cure to him. Oh, there's a bit of pain there, so there's a nerve. Do you want to pop another drop of marcaine in there? Mm -hmm. So this is just some local anaesthetic to make sure that Jasper really can't feel anything. In southwest London, Michael is about to take out the damaged left eye of five-year-old guinea pig Jasper. And I just have to make sure I'm happy, I know what I'm cutting, and that's all just more connective tissue. And there we go. That is the diseased eye. And all this white stuff in the socket is a lot of pus and infected tissue. I was kind of expecting to see this amount of pus because when you saw how far Jasper's eye was being pushed out the socket, you've got to think, right, something's going to be beneath this eye that's doing that. So what I have to do is try and scoop out as much as I can. So you see that there, that's just pus. Get rid of all of this, because one of the complications of this type of surgery is if I don't remove all that infected tissue, when I close up the eye socket later on, that can just create more of an infection. There is a lot of infected tissue. It's really thick, so you can't actually wipe it away. You have to remove it physically in these lumps. So I'm feeling quite relieved at the moment because finding this abscess basically confirms all of my suspicions and it justifies why we're doing this surgery. So we've made the right decision for Jasper, which is great. Ooh, it's a nice pus there. <laughs> Whenever there is pus, vets and nurses get maybe overexcited. It's just one of those satisfying things that when you get to express it, you're just like, oh, that's disgusting, but you can't stop looking at it at the same time. I'm the same, I, I like the disgusting things. Yeah, yeah I, um, exactly. I, I'm not a very squeamish person. So I'm just gonna try and flush out as much as I can with the saline. Yeah, that's looking good. Jasper's eye socket is now free of infection. Okay, so we're gonna start closing up the eyelid now. Everything so far has been, you know, pretty good. I'm very relieved. However, we're still not out the woods. Underneath the facade, you know, I am quite worried. It is a race against time, because the longer that Jasper is under anaesthetic, the higher the risk of death. As much as I need to be careful about what I'm doing, I also need to be quite fast paced and try and get this done so that we can wake him up. I think if Jasper pulls through, I will personally go to the shops and buy a big bag of his favorite food, which is basil. In London, Chalky is finally waking up after surgery to remove a massive lump from his abdomen and Dot's foster carer Leslie has returned to pick him up, acutely aware of how much Chalky means to his loving owner. When they're vulnerable and they're scared and they don't have anything, these dogs give them unconditional love and a reason to keep going. I have been told many times by different people, if it wasn't for this dog, I wouldn't be here now. Hi. Hello. Here he is. Hello, Angel. Newly lightened. 
Hello, sweetie pie. Say hi. Hi. Look at you. Are you feeling a bit more comfortable now? Reuniting Chalky with Leslie, it's beautiful to see. He's got that beautiful staffy smile. Leslie's smiling, I'm smiling. It's a real happy fest. And I'm really sure that this dog is gonna heal beautifully and hopefully at some point get back to his loving owner. But uh, he seems very happy now that's gone. Yes. There's a very vascular lump. Yeah. Uh, took a lot of sort of managing all the, yeah. the, the bleeding, mm -hmm. but um, once that was done, it came out relatively easily. It was yeah. attached to one layer of okay. musculature, right. but um, I feel that the margin's very good. So I'm yeah. hopeful that even if yeah. the results of the lab come back as something quite concerning, yeah. I do still feel that we've got a curative result from the Brilliant. surgery. So. It will be a week before Scott gets the results from the lab, but in the meantime, Chalky will be cared for at the Dogs on the Street sanctuary until his owner is ready to have him back. I'm sure that his owner's gonna be pretty happy and relieved. Yeah, absolutely. We'll update him this afternoon, yeah. let him know that it all went well. I'll make sure that they're reunited as soon as possible. All Thank right. you so you much, Scott. All the best. Thank nice you. To see you. You're Take very care. welcome. Bye, champion. Come on then, baby. See ya. The work that Dogs on the Streets or Dots does is so valuable to so many people. The love and affection is really one of the only relationships in some of these people's lives so to be able to keep that intact and support them with the things that they're going through trying to get them back on their feet and then allowing them to be reunited with their animals well it really is a beautiful service and an amazing charity so i'm just doing the final knot of stitches in southwest London, Michael has finished the delicate eye removal surgery on Jasper the guinea pig. It seems like everything's going well so far with the anaesthetic. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. everything's been really stable, really happy with the anaesthetic throughout the whole thing. Brilliant. So uh, now we just have to wake him up. Yeah. Michael and nurse Lucy are ecstatic their little patient, against the odds, has made it safely through the operation. I think I'm very happy with how things have gone at the moment. However, we have to hope that he wakes up quickly so that we can get him eating again before Sarah comes to pick him up. So we're still holding our breath. For owner Sarah and her children, it's been an anxious day. You just sort of worry how the little guy's getting on. Keep looking at your watch, keep thinking, how's he getting on? You know, is he going to get through this? We've been joking, we're going to get him like a little eye patch. One-eyed bandit boy, maybe he'll new career as a pirate or something. Hey, you feeling okay? Oh yeah, he's starting to move there, which is great. Right now I'm really happy because we can see signs of life. He's starting to move, you can see a bit of a twinkle in his eye, so he's back in the room basically. Look who it Jesse. is! There's your mom. Oh, Jesse! <laughs> oh, matey! Moments like this are what I live for as a vet. You know, giving a sick patient back to the owner and just seeing their reaction. It's such a satisfying moment. It's what really drives me to do this every day. Oh, good Can boy. It? And then just let him chew it. Oh. Hey. So you might have to continue syringe feeding him a mm -hmm. bit more once he's home. But to make things a bit easier for you, I did get a nice big bunch of fresh basil, his favorite Yay, thing. So, uh, so yeah, he can munch on that later on when yeah. he's a bit more awake, awake from the anesthetic. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to smell the basil? Okay. Oh, no, no, no. He wants it. That's it. Okay. Do you want to smell it? You can eat some of that later on, okay? Not right now. <laughs> Jersey. Little man. The best <laughs> case scenario I think we could have hoped for, and that. Like he's come through it all and it's a pretty massive operation. My daughter's gonna be probably the happiest. It's her guinea pig. She's had him for five years now and we'll get him home and get him eating his basil and he'll be back out in the garden really soon. Brilliant, well, we'll see you soon then. Yeah, okay. take care, thank right. you take so care. much, Michael. Come Bye, on, Jasper. dude, let's get you home. Off we go. Well done, Jazzy. Well done. Two weeks after Scott removed a huge mass from the side of Chalky's body, the brave dog has been given the all clear and has made a full recovery. His foster carer is happy to report he's now back with his owner and getting plenty of TLC. Good 
Goodbye. In northern Yorkshire, an emergency case has just been rushed in for Louisa. Chocolate Labrador Benson. Is it a silly mini chocolate Labrador? The owner's been playing around with him in the park and he's collapsed and he's off his back legs. Uh, the temperature is 42.2 degrees C, which is alarmingly high. That can actually be impacting his organs, his brain. Um, this, you know, he's, he's, he's a potentially be seizure in. Benison's been running around like a lunatic with another puppy and he's just got himself so hot and worked up that he's actually suffering from heat stroke. Hello, hello, hello. Waiting outside, Benson's owner Sharon is sick with worry. I had a chocolate Labrador for 13 and a half years and he died last May. It's like losing a family member and it's given me a fear of losing my new dog, just really upsetting. So, you know, losing another one is like a heartbreak and I don't want to do that, so hopefully he's going to be all right. Good boy. Heat stroke is life threatening because when the temperature rises within the body, it can cause our organs to shut down. So it's really, really dangerous. We have had cases where we can't save them or they've already come to us and, and they're, they're dead, which is scary thought. We need to get him cool and then we'll try and see if we can keep his temperature nice and stable. So cute. In London, anxious owner Suzanne is returning to Scott's Isleworth practice with adored guinea pig nugget. It's just that eye, look at it. It looks like a fish eye, doesn't it? It looks like a sort of cod. It's a bit crusty around there where I've been putting the drops in. Last week, after examining Nugget's bulging eye, Scott prescribed medicated eye drops, hoping they might help fix the problem. I can't see much improvement with that with Nugget's eye. It's a bit scary. Uh, we'll have to see what happens today. Poor little pig. So cute. Hi, Suzanne. Oh, hi, hi Nugget. <laughs> Hello, you. You're looking very warm and cosy in there. <laughs> All right. It's the best place for him. Do you want to bring okay, him I'll in? Bring him in yeah, okay. come on then. Let's go. Right, so. Well, take a look at that. <laughs> yes. How you been getting on with those drops? Yeah, he's been fine. He hasn't really complained about anything. He's just hasn't. He's, he seems okay. Yeah. Just but, holding um, him around the bum there, just sort of support him like that. That's lovely. So, yeah, I mean. He still kind of looks like he's looking at something, doesn't he, up in the sky? I must say, I've never seen an eye look quite as prominent in a guinea pig as this. Poor piggy. There's a couple of ways that we can determine if an eye is functional or not. First, we use what's called a menace reflex, which is basically kind of almost fake poking the guinea pig in the eye. And if you see a finger coming towards your eye, you will close your eye to protect yourself. Yeah, you, can, you can't, that other eye is definitely, you can definitely see. Functional, yeah. In this case, this guinea pig wasn't flinching when my finger was going towards it, so it shows that the eye probably does not have any vision. I'm gonna have a little look in the eye. Yeah. Oh, he's watching the way you're going with his... <laughs> Look, he's, he's turning over. Oh, I'll pick it up again. <laughs> oh, you're passing. Yeah. This is a bit clingy. Look at this. Hey, I've never seen him so clingy. On this side, we have an eye where the pupil closes down when it's exposed to light, okay. which it does because it protects the retina at the back of the mm -hmm. eye. Uh, on this eye, however, it's the pupil doesn't that. move, no. Mm -hmm. So what it could mean is that there is something behind the eye pushing it out. Uh, and that could be something not very nice. So that's the bit oh that we need God. to investigate today. Right. But what I think we need to do is, because it's not actually Look. improving. Oh, mm -hmm. he loves you, doesn't he? That's <laughs> sweet. Um, because it isn't improving and it's a kind of consistent likelihood of discomfort then it's a welfare issue to yeah, remain in place so that's kind of where i think that it is best sadly that we do remove his eye yes clearly this eye is being pushed out of his head whether we like it or not and it will either become injured or cause him discomfort so from a welfare perspective unfortunately the best decision is to have the eye removed Poor piggy. Good 
girl, Linda. In London, Jackie is bringing Linda in to see Michael, desperate for help for the little rescue pug. Linda's a good girl, aren't you? Eight-year-old Linda has had a serious skin issue ever since Jackie saved her from a puppy farm in Hungary. Off to see the vet now, good girl. Linda has a skin fold issue where the fold above her nose is too thick. She's really struggled with it medically. She rubs her face, she's caused eye ulcers in her eyes from rubbing her face. Good girl. Jackie's hoping Michael will have a solution to finally bring Linda some relief. Morning, Jackie. Morning. Hi, gorgeous. Hey, Linda, how are you doing? Hey, how's she doing today? She's, she's great, okay. yeah, she's good. Hey. Brilliant. Well, should we go inside? Have yeah. a chat? Great. great. Let's go. Thank you. Okay, so how's everything been? Because I know that last time we spoke, we discussed trying to manage the, the skin fold. What have you been doing to try and keep them clean? So we've been using the pads, yeah. and we've also been using the eardrops that you gave me, Michael. Yeah, with the antibiotic. With the there. antibiotic, yeah. yeah. Linda's got a condition called facial fold dermatitis. So basically this is something that pugs get quite often. And it's when there's so much extra skin on their face, you end up with painful inflamed skin. It becomes really itchy. And in Linda's case, she keeps trying to pour at her face because of the irritation. So I think you can see, even though we're doing all of that every single day, that skin in there just looks so inflamed and moist, isn't it? So let's just have a quick look at how deep these skin folds actually are. So I think the main problem that we're seeing is, is here between the nose and the forehead. And can you see that ulceration and that inflammation there? Yeah. So sometimes surgery is a permanent solution to this problem. The problem with facial fold dermatitis is that you have these layers and layers of skin. It becomes really moist and dirty inside there and that's the perfect breathing ground for infection. So I basically decided there and then surgery is the best option. And we remove some extra skin to reduce the size of the skin fold and you eliminate any possible infections from recurring. So what would happen, Michael, if we didn't go ahead with the operation? She would just have a lifetime of constant skin infections, constant irritation. And we know that sometimes it gets so bad with Linda that she really starts pouring at her face and rubbing her face and that can lead to really dangerous eye ulcers. And there have been numerous pugs that have actually had to have their eyes removed. When deciding to go for surgery, there are several risks involved, especially with all the flat face dogs like Linda. Pugs do unfortunately have higher anesthetic risk, and that's just due to their inherent breathing issues. So we never go into this decision lightly. So basically the plan for today is to make an incision starting from that side there of the face, going all the way up, above the nose and down to that side. I'm quite nervous about the op today only because she's a pug and the general anaesthetic is always a risk. So I am nervous. And uh, she'll be in good hands, okay? Yeah. We'll, we'll take good Thank care you, of her. Thank you, Michael. Okay. And don't worry, Linda, after today, you still have your modeling career. Yeah. You're gonna be nice and pretty. We're gonna get you on the, the cover of Vogue. Hmm? <laughs> Are you gonna sit You're with me? You're in good hands, aren't you? Oh, I love you, Linda. Oh. <laughs> love you, Linda. Brilliant. We'll see you later on, Jackie. Bye. All right, take care. Poor little eye. At Scott's Isleworth practice in London, little guinea pig Nugget needs major surgery to remove his bulging eye. Um, so he'll have a kind of permanent wink. I'm well, afraid. you're going to give him a lie patch, aren't we? <laughs> He'll be a pirate guinea he pig. He is a pirate guinea pig. Owner Suzanne is putting on a brave face, despite the drastic surgery. I think it's quite horrific having an eye taken out because obviously it's not something that would normally happen to a person. What we'll be doing is obviously removing the eye and then I'll be able to look into uh, the eye And if there is socket. something sinister, what will happen? It depends what it is. It really depends what it is. Can you treat uh, something sinister? Uh, in guinea pigs it is very challenging uh, because in most cases the, the, the chemotherapy options are very limited. So we just have to really hope that that's not the case. God, I hope not. Well, let's be positive. Exactly. And hopefully it'll be fine. Yeah. So cute, cute little noises. It is cute. So maybe we'll pop him back in his little box. Okay. There you go. All right. 
So, okay. I come in to say goodbye. Oh, he's trying to kiss me. He's trying to give you a kiss. Oh, that's so cute. Be good and be safe. Okay. See you on the other side. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay, bye, bye, bye. Bye. Say bye, mummy. Bye. <laughs> the best outcome would be that Nugget would be not in pain and hopefully there's another couple of years left in him. Um, hopefully. So, this is Nugget. And Nugget has quite a nugget of an eye. To think I'm going to take an eye away, it's the, the window to the soul and you know it's what you look at in your pet adoringly. So to remove one is, is a big concept. Oh, you're very sweet. You've stopped squeaking now, is it because mummy's not here? Alright little piggy, here we go. There you go, I know, I know. Sure, I know. Oh, we're sorry, we're sorry. Safely anaesthetizing the five-year-old will be the trickiest part of the surgery. Unfortunately, I have had some very sad situations where small creatures like guinea pigs just simply don't cope with the process of the anaesthetic. And they die before you even have a chance to perform surgery. So to anaesthetize an animal like this does come with significant risks. There are initial highs and lows where he's waking up suddenly. When we're clipping the nails, he can feel it a little bit. So we're just navigating through that early part of the anesthetic to make sure that it's not too deep that we potentially lose him, but not too light that he'll feel the procedure. So this can be a little bit of a tightrope walk. Poor piggy. We need to get him cool and then we'll try and see if we can keep his temperature nice and stable. In North Yorkshire, Louisa and her team are frantically trying to bring down Benson's temperature. The nine month old Labrador is suffering potentially fatal heat stroke. We're going to kind of rapidly cool him. We'll stop before his temperature gets too low. 42.2 degrees C. He is red hot. His temperature is 42.2 degrees going up. So a dog's temperature shouldn't exceed maybe 38.8 degrees Celsius. As the nurses cool him down with cold water, Benson's owner Sharon worries she could lose the young dog she's fallen deeply in love with. When I lost my other dog, the house was empty, I couldn't cope. So at Christmas time we found this other litter. We went to Norfolk and got him from Norfolk and then brought him home on New Year's Eve. He's grown like a big giant now. He's a massive nine-month-old Labrador, and he's just my world. <laughs> so it's coming down, it's 41, 41 degrees at the moment. To everyone's relief, Benson's alarmingly high temperature is beginning to drop. Yeah, so it's coming down nicely now, so we're about 40 and a half degrees. It was, he was 42.2 degrees Celsius when he came in here. When he came in, he was collapsed, he couldn't use his back legs, he was very weak. Luckily, Sharon, you know, Benson's mum brought Benson to us straight away, so we can treat him. Whereas, you know, if we were left another hour or two, Benson potentially could have died. In the 10 years, I've seen three heat strokes here, so it's not as common here, but it, it does happen. We tend to... I think what we'll do is we'll see if he can stand up now. Come on, come on. Oh, <laughs> so he, he came in not able to walk and now he's now he can, but we're not by any means out of the danger zone. He's still very hot. He'll need a lot of close monitoring. You're cheeky! So basically the plan for today is to make an incision starting from that side there of the face, going all the way up over the... At Michael's practice in London, Linda the Pug is about to get a facelift to help relieve her aggravating skin condition. And don't worry Linda, after today you still have your modelling career, yeah, you're going to be nice and pretty. But the surgery is going to be risky. Pugs do unfortunately have higher anaesthetic risk and that's just due to their inherent breathing issues. Whenever we're relaxing the muscles due to the anaesthetic and sedation, everything can become a bit more 
uh, clogged up basically. So it's very important to be quite swift, get a patent airway and intubate as quickly as possible. Okay, there we go, we're in. And now that we've induced her, we just want to make sure that she starts breathing on her own. So this is a really important time for us to just make sure that she's in a stable anesthetic and then once we're happy, we can continue to the operating theatre. It can be a risky moment when you induce a pet for, for an anesthetic because you never know how they're going to react, basically. How's she doing? No, not yet. So we just need to watch it quite closely. Come on, Linda, you can do it. If Linda continues to not breathe, we have to think why this is happening. And sometimes that can be due to her reacting badly to the anesthetic. Something could be going wrong inside, maybe to do with her heart or her lungs. Is her heart rate stable? Yeah. I think she might be taking some small breaths. Uh, no, I think she's taking some very shallow ones, isn't she? Okay. Linda's finally taking a breath on her own after a few minutes of uh, quite tense monitoring. So we're both very relieved at this. And if she continues to breathe now, that means we can progress to the procedure. Ready? Yeah. Oh my gosh, this poor face. It's always quite tricky getting all the hairs and the nooks and crannies of these folds. But we basically have to try and remove as much as possible. Because if you don't get rid of bacteria and then you make incisions into the skin, that bacteria can then get in there. And that's when you end up with nasty post-op infections. After the initial scare with the anaesthetic, Let's go, Linda. Linda is at last ready to have the excess facial skin that's caused years of irritation and infection surgically removed. Let's put on five milligrams per kilogram, so that'll be slightly higher. There are a few different things I need to take into consideration. If you take too much skin from Linda's face, I can end up causing tightness underneath the lower eyelids and that can actually stop a dog from blinking. And if that happens, then we're in deep trouble. It can even lead to blindness. It's quite funny, when you look at her through this little drape, you wouldn't think that that's a dog, more like some wrinkly alien yeah. of some sort. Are you happy for me to start? Yeah, I can start. Brilliant. In London, Scott is trying to stabilise guinea pig nuggets so he can start his delicate eye removal surgery. The challenge is just trying to keep them deep enough you can perform the surgery, but light enough that they stay alive. So it's going to be a little bit of a tightrope walk. Being a smaller creature, they are just a bit more delicate, but also they have a fast metabolic rate, so they can go deep and then they can go shallow with their anaesthetic as they process it quicker. Plain of anesthetic is pretty good. Okay, all right, I'll get scrubbing. The surgery to remove an eye is called an enucleation, and basically we start by suturing together the eyelids. So we're just gonna get going now. Just gonna first of all close the eye, which is sad. This will be the last time I'll see the eye. It's a little bit sad. I always feel like it's like the window to the soul, you know, but he has got another eye, it is functional, and this eye is causing him discomfort. Okay. Do you think it's good enough, this anesthetic? Yeah, I'm, 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 it would be interesting to see what happens when I do my first cut, uh -huh. because yeah. um, that will tell us, won't it? Yes, yeah, so there's just a little, just a little bit of tensing there. So we just got up to three and a half, please. Okay, let's go. It is quite tricky, quite fiddly, but also relatively quick, simply because it's a smaller bit of anatomy than, say, for a cat or a dog. So this will be quite delicate when I get to this position. Pulling on the optic nerve, and sometimes you can irreparably damage the ability of the animal to see. Now what we need to do is remove the entirety of the eyelid structure and the eyeball itself. what that is.
You're happy for me to start? Yeah, I can start. Brilliant. In inner London, Michael is carefully cutting away excess skin from Linda's face to prevent ongoing infections that have made the pug's life a misery. Okay, so that's going down there, and then there, and then the plan is to pull that down to there. There we go. It's quite a tricky surgery because there's so much loose skin and so many flaps in a very small area. The main thing I want to do here is make sure that Linda remains as beautiful as she was before the surgery. Maybe even prettier, we'll see. And right now I'm about to remove the flap of skin from underneath the left eye. There we go. Things can get quite tricky when you're trying to cut away skin from this area because there are so many vessels and, and important structures around the eye as well. If you were to cut a facial nerve, you could then cause facial paralysis, for example. As Michael reshapes Linda's face, Nurse Audrey is keeping a close watch on the eight-year-old's vital signs. Linda's got slightly low blood pressure at the moment. Okay. Blood pressure's a bit low, um, so what we're going to do is just give Linda a large amount of fluid in a very small amount of time, and that can increase the blood volume, and that increases the, the blood pressure. And the last thing you want is a dog to go under cardiac arrest while we're, we've got an open wound in front of us. Linda's blood pressure soon stabilizes, and Michael is hoping he can complete the life-changing facelift without any further complications. It is starting to come away quite nicely, so I am you know, I'm holding my breath, but things are looking good at the moment. And that is the last bit of skin, so I'm going to start stitching up. Nearly at the finish line here. That's it. So make sure that all the skin is nicely held together. Okay, brilliant. So the moment of truth, the unveiling of Linda's new face. <laughs> right, that's all you're getting, just a little bit. In Northern England, Benson's raging temperature is now under control after a potentially fatal case of heat stroke. I'm going to be checking his temperature and when it's dropped to uh, around 39 degrees we'll then stop and let his body lower his temperature up by himself because he'll be wet and cool and we'll have the aircon on to try and cool him down by himself. Sit, sit down. Right. Beep, beep, beep. Right, I'll go and tell your mummy that you're okay. Hey, sit down. Wait there. You cheeky. Hello. So he's doing much better. His temperature has come down from 42.2 to now 38. So the normal temperature is about 38 and a half, 38.8. So we've put him, cooled him down, he's had a nice bath, he's had something to eat. The good news is a huge relief for Benson's devoted owner, Sharon, who's been worried sick her much loved Labrador might not make it. But he's recovered and as soon as he's cooled down, he was happy to walk and wag his tail and we all got absolutely <laughs> soaked. Yeah. What a good boy you are, am I? Oh, thank you. His temperature is completely normal now, so that's good news, isn't it, mister? Well, we seem to have got out of the danger zone, we've dropped his temperature and he's not had any seizures, so we seem to be a bit safer now. So the next thing is we need to get a blood sample because we know that overheating wreaks havoc on the internal organs, we know that they can go into organ failure. There we go. Good boy. Kidney, liver, all good? They're fine. So yeah, pleased with those. So he's okay just to go home once yeah, we, so we, we can send him home. So the blood tests just showed that his organs were functioning absolutely fine. There's no changes there, so we've got nothing to worry about. Come on then. Temperature's down, blood's are clear. He's happy as a clown wagging his tail. Come on, let's go. He's been a typical young Labrador and he's desperate to go home, so we're going to get him home. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Hello beautiful boy. Hello. Oh, he's loads better, isn't he? Come on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, he's peed everywhere. The frisky nine-year-old is clearly excited to see Mum Sharon. Is this your departing gift to me? It is. Yeah, I'm feeling relieved now that he's all right. At least they've got him sorted out, so that's we can get him better now. That's good. All right, for the looks. Come well, on. Thank you very much. No, you anyway. take care. Thank you very see much. You see you later. Bye bye. All happy now. Yeah, beautiful boy. Oh, 
dear. In London, minutes into guinea pig nuggets eye removal surgery, Scott has made a potentially devastating discovery. Yeah. I'm worried about what that is. Is there a mask behind the eye? Looks like it. As soon as I take the globe, the eyeball away, I immediately see something that I shouldn't, which is a large, white, fleshy structure. It isn't fat, it's a little bit thicker than that, and I am concerned about the possibility of it being cancer. Yes, there's uh, not really any chemotherapy options for guinea pigs. So it does actually come out quite nicely. So there is the... So you can see it's almost as big as his eye. It's no surprise that the pressure that it produced at the back of his eye was leading to it popping out like it was. And I can see the fat pad that normally is there and the tissue that I've removed is different from it. So I'm pretty certain that this is a tumour. All I can do is to try and remove the tumour in its entirety. And that's really tricky because of where it is. This is so close to his brain. I can't remove any more tissue than is absolutely necessary. So yeah, I mean, actually, I'm pretty satisfied that I've got all the tumour that I can see out. I'm now going to close up. I'm pretty happy with the result. I've removed absolutely every single thing that I can see, but unfortunately, even one cell that may have gone further in can then end up regrowing, but I've done the best I could. Okay, and that's that. Okay, so let's wake him up. The recovery process from anesthetics can be equally shocking for a small creature like that. So we're not out of the woods yet until he's moving around normally and eating. Hey, yes, a bit, bit piratey, but very handsome pirate. Hey, still beautiful. Yeah. Hi, baby. So the moment of truth the unveiling of Linda's new face. <laughs> that is looking very nice. In London, Michael has finished delicate skin removal surgery on rescue pug Linda. I'm pretty happy with how that looks cosmetically. Nice and symmetrical. I can see that there's no more skin to skin contact and that was the main issue in the first place. All in all, things are looking great and Linda looks beautiful. Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> oh, hello. This is a really good sign. You know, she's had a very stable anaesthetic, nothing that made our heart stop, or hers. Um, <laughs> so, and to see her like this is a very good sign. And she's breathing nicely as well. Well done, sweetie. Good girl. Good girl. For owner Jackie, it's been an anxious wait hoping her little girl is finally free from debilitating pain and constant infection. So I've been really nervous the last couple of hours waiting for the call that, you know, the operation went smoothly, everything went well with the anaesthetic. You excited to see your mum, hey? Yes, you've been such a good girl. <laughs> oh, hi Linda. Oh. oh, look at you. Can you give mommy a kiss? Oh, brave girl. I'm actually very pleased with how the surgery went. She did have a lot of loose skin, okay? So what we did was remove just enough so that we can remove any skin-to-skin -skin contact. So you can see here, no skin touches another part. So that means that as things heal, we won't have any more um, infections. Do you like a haircut? It's great, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's always a great feeling when you see pets reunited with their owners. And in this case, you can see Linda is just so happy to be back with Jackie. You look good, yeah. don't you? Yes, you're going to be a beautiful dog. You look great. Hey, we'll get you yeah. modeling again in no time. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Oh, is that nice? There we go. There. <laughs> she likes these scratches. Eh? Hopefully plain sailing from here and she'll recover quickly. Yeah. Okay, Linda, have a good recovery. Thanks so much, no Michael. Problem. I'll see you soon, okay? Thank you very much. Bye, Jackie. <laughs> Right, take care. Bye. Bye, bye, Michael. Bye. I was so relieved when I picked up Linda. This is going to make a huge difference to her life. She doesn't have to have treatment anymore. She's going to be a happier dog. Good girl, Linda. Good girl.
At Scott's Isleworth practice in London, anxious owner Suzanne is eager to be reunited with her beloved guinea pig Nugget. I've just cleaned the guinea pig cage out, ready for Nugget's return. And um, yeah, just trying to not think about it actually. Hi Suzanne, do you want to come Hi. through? It is always lovely to return an animal back to their loving owner. Nugget's been a brave boy. He'll be going home to lots of snuggles with mum. There he is. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, look at him. So there he is. Oh my god, he looks so scary. Do you think? No, it's because you shaved his head. <laughs> It is quite funny seeing Suzanne's response, not so much focused on the incision line, the surgery, more on his haircut. But hey, the hair will grow back and he'll just look like he's winking all the time. Honestly, he will look just fine given a few weeks. The but shaving's the least of his problems. I know, what are you going to tell me something bad? Well, um, unfortunately there was a mass behind his mm -hmm. eye, yeah. I'm afraid. His eye and the mass are about the same size. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm pretty certain that it's not going to be something good just simply because there is fat that lives behind the eye, yeah. but I found the fat. Okay. This looks different. Oh dear. Yeah. So, have you taken that away? I feel pretty confident that I have removed it all, but it is in the end a case of a lack of margin, which is where we take a section of healthy tissue. That's not possible. Okay, so, so it will come I've back. So, taken possibly. away, it, it potentially could, yes, even just with a few yeah. cells that oh, might look regrow. at him. He's so sorry. Look at him. Our job isn't always cuddling puppies and stroking kittens. Sometimes it is really hard, and we have to give really unfortunate news. And I'm delivering the news that unfortunately he does seem to have a cancerous lump and he may not be around for much longer. Guinea pig? Yeah. Who'd have them? Well, you would and you obviously love him. <laughs> I do love him. I do love him. As a vet we need to champion animal welfare and in the case of Nugget I've done exactly that. He'll be so much more comfortable no matter how long he lives for. Well, at least he survived the operation. He did. He might not have, might he? He did really well. He did really well under the yeah. anaesthetic. Totally happy that he's had that. It could have been worse. It could have been worse. It could have been a lot worse. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry for the bad oh, that's news. That's okay. Well. He's done five years. Who knows how much longer. Um, he could be the world's longest guinea pig survivor. He could. He could. Let's keep him going until it's about 15. Thank you very much. You're so okay. All right. Thanks a lot. All the best. Okay, thank See you. Ya. Bye. 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 It's been a month since Michael performed skin removal surgery on Pug Linda, and life has changed dramatically for the little rescue dog. Good girl, Linda. She no longer suffers from skin irritation and infection, and owner Jackie says she's now pain-free and much happier. And Louisa's emergency patient, Benson, has also made a full recovery after suffering near fatal heat stroke. The lively young dog is back to his frisky self, but is now enjoying less boisterous outings to the local park. Hi, morning. Hi. What's going on this morning? So we've just had a cat called Merlin brought in. Looks like he's got um, a severe trauma to his left leg. Um, he's also had a, a knock to the head. In North Yorkshire in the UK, Louisa is starting work and is immediately facing an emergency. He's fractured some teeth. He's had some methadone to make him comfortable. So I've arrived this morning and they've told me that there's a lovely cat called Merlin who's been hit by a car. He's stable, but we believe that he might have sustained quite a nasty break to one of his legs. There's a lot of swelling around here. As well as a suspected broken leg, Merlin has suffered severe trauma to his head. He's got a fractured canine and a fracture to the back tooth. Anxiously waiting for news of their beloved two-year-old is owner Jason and his young daughter Lily. You miss him. Your best friend, isn't he? He's a massive part of the family. We've got um, two dogs as well. And it, it just plays with them. It, 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 honestly, it's like Tom and Jerry in the house. They just chase each other, lay with each other. I, the dogs are feeling it. I can tell he's not there, obviously. I just can't wait to get him back home. Hello. Yeah. So I've got your little, your little cat Merlin in, haven't I? Do you want to tell me what's happened to Merlin? Got him back older. He did? Oh, no. 
It was my wife that found him. He was initially just lifeless laid there, and then obviously when she got closer, she seen the blood on him and the missing skin on his leg. Yeah, yeah. Tried to talk to him, and he just mm -hmm. wasn't responding. Yeah. It looks like he's damaged that leg, doesn't he? Because he doesn't want to use that leg. And that leg is potentially broken. So what we'll need to do is take some x-rays and then we'll make a plan together. Um, so I will show you the x-rays. Hopefully it's something that we can fix. But if not, we'll, we'll make a plan together and we need to get him sorted, don't we? We want to get him home. Yeah, are you missing him? Missing him? Yeah, I bet. Okay, cool. I'll go and do that and then we'll go from there. Okay? Thank you. So this is the x-ray. Um, you can see here quite a nasty fracture to the top of the humerus and it's in such a horrible place it's all really swollen and really painful. We're quite limited with our options in this position of the leg which is why we had to have quite a frank conversation with the owner. So I'm feeling really sad. The fracture could actually be the tip of the iceberg. We could be dealing with lots of other injuries in which case We've also got to think about the quality of life of that cat and consider whether Merlin, unfortunately, should be put to sleep because some cats might not recover through the surgery. It's not looking very nice for him, so we've got to have some quite serious conversations with the owner about where we go from here, really. Here to the vets. In Isleworth, London, Tracy is bringing her Cavalier King Charles Spaniel Mai to see Scott. Oh my! Mai is not a big fan of the vets, unfortunately. She gets quite frantic when we get through the door. She pulls all the way here, she just gets quite nervous. The reason is chronic issues with Mai's anal glands, which have meant ongoing and unpleasant treatment for the timid two and a half year old. It's quite painful for Mai every time they rupture, particularly like they are literally creating a little hole in her bum that shouldn't be there and it's not very nice for her. She's definitely quite uncomfortable. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Hi, hi. lovely you to meet you. Right? Yeah, really good, thank hi, you. Hi, hi. Oh, yeah, James sleeping asleep. baby. Let's keep it down, shall we? That'd be good. Shall we go into the consult room? Brilliant. I've had lots of practice, shall I drive? If you don't shall mind, yeah, right, fantastic. Here we go. Come on in, my Mai. Nice and quietly, everyone. Come on, sweetie. Poor little Mai has had a huge amount of problems with her anal glands. She's had four anal gland ruptures. She's had many, many infections and huge courses of antibiotics. If they get an infection, they then abscissate and break out the side. And of course, that will be very painful indeed. So anal glands really are probably the most poorly designed bit of anatomy on a dog. Mm. They originally are used to scent mark territory. So for wild dogs, in the case of companion animal dogs, what happens is the anal glands, they kind of build and build and build, and when they get to a certain size, they actually block their own duct off. And she is an example of a dog that's really suffered with anal glands. Yeah. She's only two and a half, and it's already happened so many times, and the vet's explained it is likely to keep on happening, so actually we'd just like to get it solved once and for all. That's a lot of pain to endure over the course of just a short two-year lifespan. Oh, she's such a chill little dog. She's yeah. so lovely, so good-tempered. Saying so tolerant with James and everything else and with this as well. She's just, she's brilliant, so yeah. Mai is so sweet-natured to James. Yeah. You want to sit next to my Mai? One of the few words that he knows is my Mai. The two of them growing up together is really, really sweet. They're really, really lovely together. Lucky boy. <gasps> I could not imagine not having her now. She is just always so happy to see you. She's just been an absolutely perfect addition to the family. Yes, I can see a bit of scarring on the uh, left-hand side, which is the most recent rupture site. I think we, and that's including you, have battled valiantly to try and manage this without going down the surgical route. Yeah. But unfortunately, I think enough's enough. Scott believes the solution is to surgically remove Mai's anal glands. The rupturing does make my job more difficult yeah. because rather than having these pristine glands that you can see and you can inflate and you can remove, yeah. I'm going to have a lot of scar tissue. Yeah. And there are significant complications that come with performing surgery so close to the anus. Yeah. Worst case scenario, you can have an incontinent dog. Yeah. You can tell that Tracy's really nervous about today. Mai is kind of her first baby, the fur baby, and with James as well, clearly having a strong bond with the dog. It is a pretty big decision for Tracy to make. Do you want to give her a little bit of a kiss to say goodbye? Give me a good girl, yeah? 
good girl, sweetie. You can be fine. Come on then, here we go. I know there can be a few side effects and a few things that can go wrong, so that makes it particularly nerve-wracking. We really hope it is worth the risk to get this operation done. See you later. Fab, thanks very All much. Right. Good All luck. Right. Speak to you later. Thank See you. Later, my, my. Bye. Oh. I know. I know. See you, my, my. I know. It's okay. Do you want to come through? Do you want to see these x-rays? Yeah. In the north of England, Louisa is about to have a difficult conversation regarding the fate of Merlin. The two-year-old cat suffered a severely broken leg when run over by a car. Lily, this is an x-ray of Merlin. Now, can you see the difference here to here? The top of this bone here has completely broken off. Merlin's owners, Jason and his daughter, Lily, are worried the family's adored cat might have to be put down. You love him very much, don't you? You worried about Merlin, aren't you? As a cat owner, I do really empathise with them. You know, it's not their fault, it, you know, accidents happen and little Lily is definitely really worried. Do you want to listen to the heartbeat of Merlin? Okay, you hold that. You hear his heartbeat? Is he okay? Good. Mm -hmm. Lovely. So, um, I think best case scenario would be we amputate that leg, okay? okay. Cats recover remarkably, remarkably well. Okay. I actually have a three-legged cat. My three-legged cat is called Oreo. I amputated her leg many years ago. I feel quite emotionally invested in this case with Merlin because I do have Oreo and she does have three legs. She came into my life very early on in my veterinary career over 10 years ago. She had a nasty fracture and I didn't want to put her to sleep. I wanted to save her, so I amputated her leg with the intention then of actually rehoming her, but she never left. So she's still doing exceptionally well with the three legs. It's not stopped her doing a thing. What I can do, Lily, I could show you videos of my three-legged cat and how well she does. Would you like to see that? That'd be good, yeah? wouldn't it? Would you like to see them now? Be good, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? <laughs> she looks really comfy, doesn't she? Yeah, she does. And she's so happy. She's not had a, a front leg for almost ten years now. Merlin does that, doesn't he? Does he? When he's content, rolls over on his back. <laughs> Reassured by Louisa's personal and professional experience, I promise you, he's going to be so happy and you won't even notice. Lily and her dad agree to removing Merlin's damaged leg. Goodbye, little fella. See you in a bit. Thank you. No worries. I'll look after him for you. Cheers. OK. See you soon. Thanks. Hi, Judith. So this is Mai. She Not has yet. had so many problems with her bum. Mm -hmm. In London, Scott's about to operate on Mai to remove her anal glands that have caused the two-year-old massive problems her whole life. She's off and on been at this vet practice since she was a puppy. So okay. today I'm going to be performing bilateral anal gland removal or mm -hmm. anal sacculectomy okay. and hope that uh, she's continent afterwards. Of course. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed, exactly, yeah. She's such a lovely girl. There is a risk with this surgery because there's a huge amount of nerves around the anus. If you cut through them, sometimes the dog can become incontinent. Today is, is just about performing the surgery to the best of our ability. Hopefully she'll go home. Uh, no more anagline problems, but still can control her bowels. Mm -hmm. Okay. You okay, beautiful? A little bit sad at the moment. Hey. Hey. <laughs> sleepy. We're sleepy. The surgery isn't the most glamorous, but Scott and Nurse Judith are besotted with all their four-legged patients. So I was that kid that used to just hug every dog that went walking that was past. Me. <laughs> ran across to the next door neighbours, hug their dog. Yeah, We'd go over friends' houses, I'd sit outside and hug the dog. I just grew up with dogs all so my life. So your dog was like your best friend yes. at that age? Yeah, my, my parents asked me, you want brothers or sisters? I said, no, I have my dog. I don't want, I don't want a brother. <laughs> Tracy, they only came in today with James, uh -huh. her little toddler, who oh, uh, the baby. was chatting away about um, his my my. 
Oh. It's a copy. <laughs> so hopefully he'll keep napping whilst you have your nap for your surgery and then you can be oh, reunited. Oh, yes. <laughs> but as Scott puts my under anaesthetic, like that, he's having drugs in you. The little dog is in trouble. Poor little Mai is not breathing. Just give him a little breath for me. With any dog going under an anaesthetic, there's risks of shock, sudden death. So we do need to perform a few techniques, stimulate her, rub her, and get her through this to start breathing. The sweet-natured two-year-old is suddenly fighting for her life. This is a bit of a difficult surgery and I do feel a bit nervous. In North Yorkshire, Louisa is about to start amputating the shattered front leg of car accident victim Merlin. This is just a sterile bandage which means that we can move the leg freely during the surgery. This is the one that will be coming off today. Louisa has called on her colleague Emma to provide an extra pair of hands for the challenging and risky procedure. But I've got my lovely colleague and friend Emma, she's one of our other senior vets and Emma and I are going to have a lovely smooth sailing surgery, we're going to get Merlin fixed and off the table in no time. So I'm going to start. The procedure itself is quite tricky because there's lots of muscles and there's lots of nerves and blood vessels and you've got to find them and take them off in a specific way, so it's not straightforward at all. We will be taking off the whole limb, including the shoulder blade. Oh my goodness. It's very awkward. The thing is, it's all very swollen, this leg as well, which can make sometimes finding your landmarks a bit more tricky. So, this is the hardest bit really, it's just kind of getting your bearings. But I think oh, yeah, it's this muscle. Sense, so. Yeah, so it's this muscle here yeah. has got to come off. That's got to go as well. Having to cut through all these muscle, it just doesn't feel natural. We just have to keep reminding ourselves that it'll make much better quality in life. If you put your fingers under there, look, so it's got to be under there, yeah, because that's the brachial plexus under there. Yeah, doing great, doing a good job. But as Louisa dissects the muscles connecting Merlin's damaged leg to his body... She's dropping a little bit. Sorry. Suddenly, the two-year-old's condition deteriorates. Blood pressure's dropped again. Right. So, can you do a little bit of a fluid bolus, please? Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure that we save his life. Come on. Come on. Come on, my sweet thing. In London, Scott and Nurse Judith are desperately trying to revive two-year-old Spaniel Mai, who has stopped breathing. Just give him a little breath for me. Giving Mai her induction anaesthetic, she just takes a little bit longer than we would like for her to start breathing. Now, a lot of dogs do react to that induction agent like that, but hers was just longer than is comfortable. No, there's a little breath there. Hmm. Yeah, she only yes, had yes. she only had two thirds of the dose as well. <laughs> okay. Oh. It's all right. Now. It's keeping me on my toes, isn't she? <laughs> yeah. This job, hey, gives you more grey hairs every day. I don't think that after 25 years of being a vet, I really need to be kept on my toes, but now Mai's breathing. Hopefully, the safe removal of her anal glands means that this dog won't have to keep going through all of this discomfort, all of these antibiotics needed to try and combat this condition. Okay, so that one's actually, I think take this one is a real mess. Now Mai's under anaesthetic, I get a chance to have a little feel of her anal glands. The right hand side, it's fairly normal, it's full of a little bit of the discharge there, but fairly standard. The left hand side, however, is very abnormal, it's very scarred, it's a bit lumpy, and as a result, that one is going to be a far harder challenge to remove. That one's going to be tricky, so... 
So what I'm doing here is I'm going to place this polymer into the anal glands. And what it does is it kind of makes them very clear so I can feel they'll be quite enlarged and then this solidifies and it's kind of like removing two olives. My nice green polymer is all solidified. Now I have to remove the glands so for the next hour or so, I will be focusing on possibly my least most attractive feature. <laughs> you are cutting in an area that's full of nerves. So you just have to be careful and take your time, breathe, focus, and just know what a nerve looks like and know not to cut it. The surgery itself is just really tricky. Uh, it's difficult to probably see in there. All the tissues are about the same color. So there's a lot of pressure on this. Ella, can you get that light in there to shine through the window and into my, <laughs> into my butthole, please? Not mine, personal butthole, but that one. Oh, That's it, and then you know where you're shooting for. Okay, yes, beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> it's just really, really challenging as a surgery to make sure you're removing the right thing and you're not cutting the wrong thing. So you're trying to make vision and sort of be like a thief in the night and get it out. Okay, that's one. The first gland does come out pretty easily, but the second gland is more challenging. It's far more attached to a number of tissues around the outside. There's quite a bit of bleeding. Right. In Yorkshire, Louisa and fellow vet Emma have hit a major hurdle as Merlin's blood pressure drops during surgery to amputate his front leg. Can you do a little bit of a fluid bolus, please? Mm -hmm. We are noticing changes to blood pressure, we are dropping temperatures, but we have things in line to sort of try and mitigate that. Blood pressure's back to normal. <laughs> the two-year-old's vital signs are now back within a safe range. So yeah, he's really settled, his temperatures come up nicely, blood pressure's normal. We'll be really careful in this bit. We're just getting to the slightly scary part. In the armpit, there's a bundle of artery and veins, arteries, veins and nerves. And so we're going to try and find them. So we're going to put local anaesthetic in the nerves, because unfortunately we obviously have to cut them. And then we'll find the blood vessels, tie them off. And then it's just a case of careful dissection to try and get the rest of the leg off without causing any further trauma to this poor little man. It's like a very busy road map. I'm getting quite stressed when I'm in there because there's lots of stuff going on. So there's lots of nerves and lots of, you know, these, these important blood vessels that if you don't find and tie them off, you're going to have quite a big hemorrhage. Sorry, mate. Tensions are high as Louisa and Emma work through the most critical part of the operation. It's trying to like... I know. Not... Sorry. The muscle, <laughs> it makes me jump. So it's well, I stabbed you then. No. You can't be blocking your fingers. It's fine. So it's totally normal to have muscle twitching. The, the, the Merlin can't feel it, but it means you know you're in the right place. So we're blocking the nerves that go to the muscle. Watch your fingers. Finally, after a few scary moments. Okay. And there he is. So relieved that the leg's off, but really sad as well because it's just... I don't know. It's just really sad to know that you've removed a leg, but you know that it's the right thing. Um, goes against your values, cutting things off when you actually want to put them back together. So now my job is to put him back together and have a lovely nice wound for him to go home with. Right, sweetheart, your new life begins. Okay, that's yeah. us done. I'm really pleased with the way it looks now. It's nice and cushioned, so when he ultimately lies on it, it won't feel uncomfortable because we've removed the shoulder blade. And sometimes if you leave the shoulder blade in, it can be quite bony and a bit uncomfortable. So yeah, I'm pleased. And now he's just got to recover. Okay. Right, sweetheart. 
boy. One. <sighs> In London, Scott is having difficulty removing the second of two anal glands that have caused a lifetime of grief for Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, Mai. So I'm just recatheterizing the anal gland just to basically get my bearings to see where it wants to come out. Performing this surgery, I realized why I don't like doing this surgery because you're constantly focused on a dog's bum, which is not very pleasant. But also the surgery itself is just really tricky. If you cut through the nerves around the anus, poor little Mai can become incontinent. Yeah, it's a real mess under here. The gland is just really damaged. So it's uh, likely gonna be more of a piecemeal removal of the remnants of the gland. After an hour of painstaking and high-risk surgery, Scott finally has removed both of Mai's troublesome anal glands. It's not the most pleasant of processes, but with patience, a lot of deep breathing and some muttered swear words, I think I've got there. <laughs> there we go. Well done. <laughs> well done. Beautiful. So the surgery itself is a success in that the anal glands are gone. So we shouldn't have any issues at all with anal glands as a result. It's just whether there's been any damage to the nerves present around the anus leading to fecal incontinence. And the proof will be in the pudding. So we'll just hope that she's able to control her poos. So the moment of truth, I'm just gonna check the anal tone just to see if her anus puckers to just sort of show me that she still has Swing to control. It, um, it's not, not hugely puckering at me at the moment. But the initial anal tone test is not promising. She's still a bit sleepy, so we'll try again later when she's woken up more effectively. Hi, baby. Okay, hopefully that's the last time I have to focus so much back there. I'm definitely not the nicer end. Yeah, okay, you good girl. Boy. In North Yorkshire, Louisa is checking Merlin to see if he's recovered enough to go home after his badly damaged leg had to be amputated. He's doing really well. He's just recovering nice and slowly. He's got some strong painkillers. Are you looking forward to look, seeing him, picking him up and getting him warm? Mm, me too. Jason and his daughter Lily can't wait to see the family cat they love so much. Constantly thinking about Merlin and shall I ring up? Are they going to ring me? Hope the operation's gone well. Um, really excited to see him. Let's go and get your mum and dad. There he is. Hey, son. Feeling a little bit snoozy, okay. He's a little bit tired. He's going to have some pain relief. But otherwise, I think he just needs some quiet time, yeah. He's so brave, isn't he? He's so brave. Yeah, there's one in the cage. Brilliant. Yeah, that's where his leg was. Are you okay? So that's his scar, and that's his scar. So he's so brave, isn't he? He looks really strange, doesn't he? Are you okay? He's so brave. He's gonna have He's so clever. It's just so nice to get them back together. He's such a lovely cat with a lovely family, and I'm really confident that he's going to make a nice recovery in no time. I'm relieved to have him back and alive, I'll be honest. He's been gorgeous. He's been an absolute trooper. Do you want to help me put that on? Well done. With Merlin's owners keen to take the two-year-old cat home, Louisa has instructed the owners on how to keep him comfortable overnight. Shall I see you soon? Yeah? I'm good, won't you? All right. Give a high five. Yeah. Your job's to look after. You Thank take you care anyway. Right. Yeah, much oh, thank you so much. See you later. Thank you. you look after him for me. Do you want to cuddle? Yeah, what you do. <laughs> that was nice, thank you. See you. Bye. Thanks, See you Cheers. later. Bye. Bye. Are you excited? Good girl. Okay. Sorry, honey. I promised you I wouldn't be messing with your bum anymore. 
In London, Scott is doing another test with Mai, hoping surgery to remove her anal glands hasn't left the young spaniel incontinent. Mm, oh, baby. I know. Yeah, it's good. You can feel it. Yeah. Okay. Now I know that she hopefully won't soil herself. She can have her tail back. Here we go, brave girl. You are so beautiful, aren't you? Oh, I'm so glad now I can focus on your beautiful face. Hey? Eh? Relieved Mai's back end appears to be working normally. Good girl, good girl. It's time to reunite the two-year-old with her loving owner, Tracy. It felt like a long afternoon, to be quite honest. Just desperate to see her now. James will definitely be happy to see her when he gets home. She'll run in the door. She'll be all excited to see him. Mai, Mai. <laughs> Okay, you ready? Let's go see mummy. Come on, man. Good girl. Hi. <laughs> Say hi, oh, mummy. Hi. 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 It. Guess what I don't have anymore? Yeah. Anal glands. Yay. <laughs> oh, sweetie. You're very happy, aren't you? Oh, My gosh. Yeah. Oh, yes. So I'm really excited to reunite Mai with Tracy. They obviously have a really close relationship and hopefully she'll start toileting normally very quickly and that's the end of her anal gland problems. Well, she's done very well. I've actually just checked her anal tone. There's a little bit of movement already, so that's okay, really good. good. Yep. So I feel confident that we're going to be good. Yes. And obviously, we'll be able to develop oh. a relationship that doesn't require me to mess with her bum. Yes, Which please. will be fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Are you keen to get out of here? Yeah. So thank you. Definitely a relief. I mean, so glad it worked out. Really, really happy. All right, see thank you later. You so much. Yes. All right, bye. Good puppy. Yeah, see you time. later. Oh, thank she's you. Free. free from the butt doctor. <laughs>
is fine. And she has had a history of pancreatitis, so we just kind of want to just double check that there's no flare-up of that as well. Good girl. So if these are all okay, she can have her general anaesthetic and we'll take those lumps off. There's no signs of infection, inflammation, changes to the liver or kidney, and we don't, which is perfect, so we're fit for surgery. Good girl. So you can see the scar from her previous surgery where she's had some um, mammary tumours removed. Today we're going to remove these big ones that are around here and actually it is also in this one. So what I'll probably do is take these tumours out and we take the whole mammary area away because they can spread to each other. We're hoping that it's benign because the other ones were sent away and they were benign but even so they can still grow and become quite nasty. So while she's relatively fit and healthy we want to get them off. Daisy's lumps tend to be more focused around the most, what we call the caudal one, so the one closest to the back end. And in that area, there's some big blood vessels. So that will be more tricky to remove, but hopefully we'll get everything out. It's only small, but there is a little pea-sized lump there. It's down here as well, so we'll have to go a bit further down. Okay. We want to just try and avoid almost taking off too much that we can't close. We're going over an area where there's been some scar tissue before, so I can already see under here, I can feel the stitches from the previous surgeries, when she had her mammary tumours removed before, so I can feel all the stitches there. So there's a lot of scar tissue, so it's a bit harder to get where you need to. And in the mammary area, there's lots of blood vessels. So the aim is that we get rid of the tumours, we get all the mammary tissue off whilst trying to mitigate any bleeding as we go. We've removed the first teat that we needed to that has the little tumours in and now we're going to the one furthest to the back end which is the one that contains the most tumours and this bit's a bit more tricky because we're going more towards the dog's groin so naturally there's a lot of fat and blood vessels that are in here. Daisy was a rescue dog, so she was never neutered. She was actually probably used as a breeding bitch, so it's put her at being susceptible to getting mammary tumours, which she has, but she's got some lovely new owners who really want to protect her, and, you know, she's having this surgery, and they trust us to try and make sure that they don't cause her any more bother. OK, so we're just about to remove all the tumours now. And there they are. All off and time to close up. The last stitch. Yeah, we are all done. Daisy will recover with lots of TLC for the next few hours. Good girl. Hello, hello. Good girl. Daisy's now fully awake after her tumour removal surgery, and Louisa is about to reunite her with owners Tom and Lynn. We're ecstatic to get her back, aren't we? Absolutely ecstatic. So it's brilliant. And so, it, you know, all things being equal, she'll, that'll be it. She'll recover now and be all right for the rest of her time. Daisy's oh. mum and dad. Come on. <laughs> Okay. Hey, you. She's been good as gold. Good. No, I can hear you. All the stitches are inside and dissolvable. Right. She's just going to be as, as expected, a little bit uncomfortable because it's quite tender in that area because yeah. it's kind of connected yeah, to your back end a little bit. Right, okay. um, she's going to be drowsy and sleepy tonight because yeah. she's 10. Yeah. No jumping, no jumping up. She can be carried. Well, she's very lucky to have you both. All right. Oh, See you Thank later. You. Bye, Thank you. Bye. It's so, so lovely to see them be reunited with their owners because it's really stressful having the owners at home worrying about them when they're here all day and it's the best part of the day when they get to go home. Come on. Good girl. Hello. Hi. 
It's been a week since Merlin had his shattered front leg amputated. Oh, that's healed so nice. Owner Jason has brought the brave two-year-old for a post-surgery checkup with Louisa. So he's adapting really well at home. Everything you would expect, yeah. Uh, I'm su quite surprised how quick he's up on his feet. Is he still wanting to jump up and off things? He jumps on the, on the sofa, yeah. I got a shock. Second day home, I opened the cage door and he jumped out, a bit like a rabbit. He's been remarkably well, so he's definitely back to his normal self. How did little Lily take to having him at home? Oh, she's loved, loved oh, him. Okay. She just wants to cuddle him. Of course, yeah. He's in the cage, yeah. he just wants to get in with him. Oh, what a treasure. Eh? The wound itself is looking absolutely gorgeous. There's no swelling, there's no infection. It's looking really nice. Should I pop you on the floor to have a look at how you walk? Go to have a look at Merlin is very, very chilled. He's recovered really well so far and he's dealing with three legs so well. He's just got no pain whatsoever. Oh, I'm so pleased for you and for him. There's no reason why he can't live to a ripe old age having three legs, being a normal cat and even being a normal outdoor cat if that makes him happy. Yeah. Oh, sweetheart. <laughs> you big softy, honestly. And the panting, obviously just a bit stressed, but I should've been panting a bit more at home as well. In the UK, another busy day is underway for Louisa at the White Cross Clinic in North Yorkshire. So she's got a cellulitis there, which is infection under the skin from dog bites. Pets are so important because I've seen relationships that mean so much to somebody. And I've seen these pets bring owners through terrible times and the bonds that they have and what these animals do for their owners, but vice versa. It's just so special. Come on, Mika. Good girl. Good girl. And one special partnership is Ali and her beloved 12-year-old Springer Spaniel, Miko. Good girl. Oh, Miko means the world to me. I've had her since she was 10 weeks old and she just comes everywhere with me. She's just my perfect dog. She comes to the beach with me all the time. So yeah, she's just my baby, to be honest. She's a massive part of the family for all of us. She means everything. Good girl. But Ali is extremely worried. She's hoping Louisa can put her mind at rest about a sudden and fast-growing lump on Miko's left side. Good girl. She's had it for a couple of weeks and obviously I was a bit obviously shocked, um, obviously concerned because I don't know what it is and obviously you associate lumps on dogs, don't you, with sort of nasty things that you don't want. Um, so I was just a bit like, oh God, what is it? Do you know what I mean? Obviously you don't want it to be anything bad. It just means everything to me. I just want the best for her. Right, so we're going to go and have a look and talk about this lump, aren't we? Yes. Miko, you've not got your bells on. Would you want to come into my room? Come on. Come on. I'm really fond of Miko and I've got a lovely relationship with Miko's mum, Ali. We've just kind of just built that relationship and it means that she knows that I would treat Miko like my own dogs. So what I'm feeling for here is how big it is and I'm putting my hands underneath it to see if it's attached to underneath, now as you can see it's quite mobile, but it is quite a big one. And the thing with lumps is that you can have non-cancerous benign lumps yeah. that we still need to remove because they're growing and bothering them. Uh, and I think it's clearly bothering you. So because it's growing, okay. I feel like we should take it off. Even though you are our golden oldie, you know, we still need to take things off and address things when, yeah. when they do become a problem. But an even bigger problem is that Miko has heart disease. But I think, you know, all things considered, because she has a heart condition, yes. what I would recommend is that we check that she's fit and well enough to, to have yeah. her procedure. That's fine. Well, obviously, hand. it's concerning when she has to have an anesthetic with the heart and things. I know, I know, I know. And yeah. And I know how much you care about her. I know. And I, and I, I, know, so. I know. I know. I think Miko's mum's going to be really nervous at home. She'll be really stressed and anxious. So there's a, a lot of pressure when somebody cares so deeply about their pet. But that is ultimately the reason why I do the job that I do. Come with me. Thank you very much. Come on, darling. Say bye to mummy. Come on then. Yeah, She's not going to come daddy. with me now. Come, Miko. Thank you, Louisa. You're all right. Good girl. That's the hardest bit, watching her go out. Um, but yeah, I already feel sad, but I'll just wait for her to come back. Good girl.
Inhale, go, go. That's it, right. Louisa is conducting an ultrasound scan on 12-year-old Miko's heart to make sure it's safe to do surgery to remove a potentially cancerous lump growing on the spaniel's torso. Excuse me. We anaesthetise pets with heart disease all the time. We just do what we can do to make sure that they're in the most stable condition possible, essentially. And that's what we're doing for Miko. If Miko fails her heart exam, it will jeopardise plans for immediate surgery. What we're looking at here is the left side of a heart and this is the right side of a heart. And we're kind of looking at the way that the heart moves, checking that everything's working okay. And so far, everything seems fine. So I feel reassured that she is going to be fit enough for her anaesthetic. The heart disease hasn't progressed since I scanned it last time. So I'm happy with the anaesthetic protocol that we've done. And yeah, I'm pleased. <laughs> it's a great result. Nurses Hannah and Ali will now prepare Miko for immediate surgery. Right, are we ready? We give her a little bit of one medication, we give her a little bit of another, and she'll hopefully just nicely fall asleep without feeling too strange. All good, yep. We'll keep listening to it throughout and check that, you know, a heart rate's not going too fast, too slow, and things like that. The heart rate's staying quite stable. A respirator is pretty nice as well. Um, and her blood pressure's staying nice um, as well. So pretty happy with her at the minute. Um, but we'll just continue to keep an eye on her just in case she throws any curveballs at us. You should be thinking about what could go wrong because then hopefully nothing does go wrong. <laughs> right, first incision. Yeah. It looks like a big collection of fat, but it's, the problem is it's quite attached at the bottom. So what we're going to do is try and go around it. Nurse Hannah is closely monitoring Miko's delicate heart condition under anaesthetic as Louisa begins tackling Miko's worrying lump, fearing it could be cancer. Let's say this is hopefully the, the benign just collection of fat, they can grow back. And so I really wouldn't like Miko to have another surgery if we can avoid it. So I'm going to try and take off safely as much as possible. But also it's attached to the abdominal muscle. So if I went too far, I could actually damage her abdominal muscles, which we obviously want to avoid. They can be quite vascular, these tumours. They often have lots of blood vessels that supply the mass and you can easily nick one and often you just have to try and find them if you can do and, and stitch them otherwise it's just a case of trying to avoid them if you can. You don't always know where they are so you've got to be really careful and sort of dissect down slowly rather than just cut willy-nilly and then you've got a bit of a bleed. Much harder to fix when you've got blood spurting everywhere so you've got to be delicate. Right, so I think we are ready to... And finally, much to Louisa's relief, the nasty mass is out. Okay, good, good. This is my favourite part of taking lumps and bumps off, is uh, stitching it back together again, because I just find stitching really relaxing. And you know that you've done the most stressful bit, now you're just making it look pretty. And that is us done. Good girl, Miko. She sailed through her anaesthetic, which is good. Really happy with how she did. Now she just has to wake up, eat some food and go home and rest. I'm pleased with how today's gone. I'm really fond of Miko. I'm just glad that she sailed through her anaesthetic and she's woken up really quickly and she's ready to go home, so I'm pleased. It's now an anxious wait for lab results on the lump to show whether or not Miko has cancer. There we go. Four hours later, Miko is ready to go home, and adoring mum Ali is anxious to be reunited with her beloved Springer Spaniel. I just can't wait to see her. I'm just like. 
I'm so excited to see her, but obviously I'm like, oh my god, I hope she's okay. So I just can't wait to see her, to be honest. Hello. 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 And Miko is so excited, she can't keep still. Oh, we haven't yet. Oh. 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 <laughs> hey, you! Yeah. And she's desperate to go back. Oh, she, bless she was perfect. She was beautiful. Reuniting Miko with her mum, that response, that moment, is the reason why we do what we do. Uh, thought you might want to see that. So, yeah, that was what was on the side wow. of her. I can't believe that was like inside her. Yeah, so we will send that off to the lab. It's not something that you probably want on oh, your shelf, no? I know. No. <laughs> Both Ali and Louisa will be on edge until the lab results confirm if Miko has cancer or gets a clean bill of health. TLC, rest tonight. She's not eating anything yet. She can have a small meal. Thank you so much, Louisa. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye, Thank you. Miko. Bye. Come on, Mika, let's get you home. Good girl. Nella, girl, come on. Good girl, come on. Louisa's next patient is a clinic regular, seven-year-old Pomeranian Chihuahua cross Nala, owned by veterinary care assistant Becca. Good girl. We've had Nala since she's a puppy. She has kind of been a problem dog, so we found out she was epileptic when she was about one. She's had both of her patellas done, and then she had an ulcer in her eye. She had some teeth taken out, and then when she came around from some anaesthetic, she ran into a door and then knocked a few out as well. So she's always in here. <laughs> we walk through the door and everyone knows who Nala is, yeah. <laughs> but we love her. My sister and me, this is like our life, so we'll do anything for her. But this isn't a social visit. Accident and illness-prone little Nala has a new problem. We found a little mass in the side of her mouth. It wasn't bothering her at first, but it has kind of grew. She kind of chews on it. So hopefully Louise can kind of either remove it or stop it from growing. Hello, Nala. Hello. Hello. Sorry, 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 sorry. Hey. Yeah, lesions. so there's a small one on that side and then there's a, a lot larger one on that one. So you can see it poking around yeah. the corner there. Nala has a condition called chronic granuloma, but it's also known as gum chewer syndrome, where she just catches the tissue around mm -hmm. her tongue every time she chews. Yeah. And it gets bigger and more inflamed. And then it's this perpetuating mm -hmm. cycle where every time she eats, she chews it and then it gets bigger and inflamed and then mm -hmm. because in her mouth it can get infected. So we will have her under anaesthetic and then under anaesthetic I'll be able to have a, a much better check over because naturally she doesn't really like me looking at her no, mouth when yeah. she's awake. It's quite hard to examine the inside of anybody's mouth so the only way that I can do this properly is with Nala fast asleep under anaesthetic where I can open and close her mouth and do a little bit of prodding and poking to see what we're looking for. This gum chewer syndrome, do you think it's got worse? It depends on the day. Mm -hmm. So usually sometimes when I'll have a look, it's either red and ulcerated where she's been chewing it a lot. Mm -hmm. But when days when she's left it alone, you can mm -hmm. see just a lump in yeah. there. So the plan is that we will put her under anaesthetic and hopefully remove as much horribly thickened tissue as possible and stitch it back. But if I feel like the tissue has become too inflamed or infected or I don't feel like it's the right thing to remove today, mm -hmm. we'll wake her back up and make a surgical plan for another day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ready to induce? Yeah. You have a little snooze, Nala. It's always nerve-wracking, obviously, when they're going under. She used to go in for operations and I'd sit in the waiting room and kind of cry, but you have total faith in, like, these guys that they know what they're doing. Sorry, Nala. For luck. Um, right, are we ready to have a look at what we're dealing with? With Nala now fully anaesthetised, Louisa can get a closer look at the damaged tissue inside the seven-year-old's mouth. You can see that it's all very thickened and quite nasty looking. And when you open and close her mouth, you can actually see where her teeth are almost rubbing and catching on it, which is why it's called the gum chewer syndrome condition, because every time she closes her mouth, 
this piece of tissue is getting stuck in the mouth and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So the aim is that we try and cut that off and she's got nothing to bite and then hopefully it resolves. This lesion on the side of her tongue, it's now just really uncomfortable for her. She's starting to show signs of difficulty eating and you know, it's time to get this removed now. But because Nala is epileptic, she's at greater risk under anaesthetic. So Louisa checks her tiny patient to make sure it's safe to start surgery. Just doing a heart check there, which is fine. Certain medications can, what we call, change the threshold to seizure, so it can put them at higher risk of seizuring, but we're going to avoid all those medications today. Also worried how her much-loved pet will cope under anaesthetic is Louisa's workmate, Becca. I'll probably be peeking through the window at times, but yeah, I'm nervous about it, but being in here, you kind of see how much they do care. I have full hope in Louisa. I trust her with her. When it's a staff and a friend's dog, you do feel that little bit of extra pressure, but also it is quite nice that she trusts that we'll hopefully do a really good job and look after Nala. It is nerve wracking when you're bringing your own pet in. I have operated on all of my pets and it can be quite hard to remain focused on objective. So. I try and take off the load from the other team members when their pets are real because it's not nice making decisions on your own pet. It's actually quite upsetting. The tricky thing is, is how we're just gonna keep her mouth open. I'll probably have to get someone to open her mouth for me to be able to do it. Senior vet Alex arrives to provide the extra pair of hands needed to remove the troublesome growth from Nala's mouth. If you hold the mouth. Perfect. Can you hold the bottom jaw for me? Squashing it, isn't it? Because the lingual vein is there. It's a bit scary, this, because right there mm -hmm. is a nice big vein. You can see this big vein going down the side of the tongue, this sort of lingual vein. It's kind of off-putting whenever you see big vessels because you spend half the time trying to make sure that you're avoiding it whilst also trying to do your job. I think it's just going to be steady, steady, steady. I do expect a little bit of bleeding, but hopefully nothing too dramatic. Surgery to remove the irritating growth from Nala's tongue is proving tricky for Louisa, as she tries to cut close to a large vein. I am trying to find a way to just kind of isolate the growth to avoid the big blood vessel. So the way I think I'm gonna do it is just put some stay sutures on and Alex to help me hold it up and then we'll just slowly, slowly cook. Louisa sews stitches into the seven-year-old's tongue, which will act as handles for Alex to elevate it. It's like microsurgery in a tiny dog's mouth. She can now safely access the tissue that needs to be cut off. Yeah, that's the vessel there, so I feel like it's... You can almost see through the tissue. But it's just there. It's quite unnatural doing things in a mouth, and also Nala's quite small, so... There's not that much space to deal with. Size is also proving a problem for Louisa, with her much taller colleague. I have to have the table lower, because I am smaller. You can put the table up and get your stool, and that would... Cheeky. I'll just crouch down. So, as you can see already, that is the tissue that we're having to get rid of, and when it's stretched, it doesn't look as thickened, but you can see this really sharp, molar down here is the one that is basically getting almost stabbed into there every time she chews. So the aim is to try and get as much off as possible. Mm -hmm. you happy the Veins down there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's it all out, isn't it? Finally, the painful damaged tissue that has distressed Nala for weeks is now gone. I think that should be all right. Yeah. I have got most of it off. Um, it looks a bit gross and I can see where it would be quite sore for Nala. So I want to make sure I don't leave anything extra that Nala could just restart chewing to make us go through all of this again. So I'm just taking a little bit extra just off the edges just before I stitch it all back up. So we're just stitching up now and then hopefully when she wakes up she'll be a lot better. 
help you getting on? Oh, she's doing really well. So we've taken most of it. So I feel like it's come off nicely. So fingers crossed that's done the job and it makes it feel a bit nicer. An anxious Becca has dropped by to see how the little dog she's raised from a puppy has responded to surgery. Yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. I think that should be okay now. Right. And we just wake her up. But because Nala suffers from epilepsy, waking her up is a perilous procedure in itself. Recovery is quite important for any pet, but particularly those with epilepsy, because in that post-operative period is when we could potentially start seizuring. What we'll do now is just turn the lights off so when she wakes up, she's not you know, being stimulated too fast, too quick, because that can be what can trigger seizures. Oh, Nala. She's just waking up now. Nala, are you with us? Hey. Nurse Becca is keeping an anxious vigil as her epileptic dog Nala slowly wakes from surgery on her tongue. So we're dimming the lights, we're keeping it nice and calm, and that's why I've got Becca to come back in. So Nala's got a familiar face, and I'm sure that would have been perfect for Nala to see her mum wake her up. It's always a relief when you see them uh, opening their eyes and coming back round. Hey, hey. She's, like, I'm ready. Hey. She's like, I'm ready to go now. <laughs> I'm happy with uh, what Louise has done. Yes, yeah, so. Oh, Nala. It's not good luck, Nala. Really <laughs> oh, Becca and Louisa will continue to keep a close eye on their patient to make sure she doesn't have a seizure while recovering from her anaesthetic. That's a nice face to look up to, isn't it, your mummy? She's actually awake really quickly. So Becca feels relieved. I'm relieved it's the end of procedure, and then we'll just get her home. That's very, very cute. So you can see what that one means to Becca. That's very cute. So we have to look after her. Extra VIP. Before long, Nala is fully recovered and ready to go home. Hello! Hi. <laughs> She's recovered really, really nicely, so we've not had any seizures. She doesn't need antibiotics or anything, just TLC at home. The plan for Nala is just to go home, no doubt she'll be spoiled, having lots of cuddles, and hopefully she wakes up tomorrow and she's absolutely normal. You certainly look better. Yes, you do. And yeah, she doesn't want that to grow back again, do we? You want to go home, don't you? Yeah, I want to go home. Right, thank you oh. very much. Off we go, come Bye. on then. Bye, Let's Nala. Go. Yeah. Bye. Let's go. Let's go. Good girl, come on. Good girl. You are behaving beautifully. Jackie's come to Louisa's Yorkshire practice, worried about an issue with her two year old Springer Spaniel, Freya. Good girl. It looks a bit like sort of cauliflower, actually, and she it limps on it or holds it up. You can tell after a walk she's a bit less inclined to put her weight onto it. Pray, please. Come on, Pray. Come on, sweetheart. Come on. Good girl. So I really like Jackie because she's spaniel mad, just like me. I have a cocker spaniel and Jackie's got five, I think, spaniels. So she absolutely loves them and she will do anything for them. Good girl. Right, this foot here. Good girl. Oh, goodness me. It's not small, is it? It is quite warty and it's annoying that it's attached right on the side of her pad, mm. which she probably has been licking this foot because mm. you can see inside it's quite red and sore. Mm. And when did you notice that she had this lump? About a couple of weeks back now. She did 
cut it, but it healed up very quickly. So whether something went in or whether she got an infection in it, we don't really know. It does look like maybe a viral warty growth maybe, or something. Yeah. Freya, is it bothering you? You don't know with dogs really, do you? No. They don't always let you know that they're hurt. No. Freya's just fabulous. She loves running, she loves the ball, she loves just everything about life. We love her and my husband absolutely worships the ground she walks on. It's not a toe and a pad that is the most important, mm. These, the, the other no, two no, are, no, no, but no. we want to try and save this pad. Yeah. So what we'll need to do is have a under anaesthetic yeah. and I will aim to cut it out and try and get rid of it all. At this stage, I don't really know what it is because I've never seen a lump like this. It's a weird one. It's just attached to the foot pad, which makes it a little bit more tricky because you can't see exactly where it starts and where it ends. All I know is that we just need to get it off because it's affecting Freya's walking. Right, it's time to come with me. Okay. Come on, sweet pea. <laughs> She's not going to wait. She's now. quite late. Yes, I'll look after her. She's got a nice bed. Do you want to come with me and say bye to Mum? You get very attached, don't you? you? Particularly when you haven't got any children at home anymore, they become part of your life. So I'm nervous about it because we love her and we don't know what's going on. Come on then. Come on then, see you soon. Come on. You good girl, aren't you? Right, little poppity poppet. Are we happy? I'm not really sure how. I will take this off because it looks like it's almost part of the pad. So we'll just have to go slow and steady. The main thing is we need to get it off because it's just, imagine walking on a ball all the time. It'll be very uncomfortable. Sweet dreams, Freya. So as I'm sort of getting ready for surgery, we've got to figure out how we're going to take this lump off. We've got to try and get it all off, try and close the gap that we make when we're removing it. We've got to figure out whether we can actually take it all off. I'm just trying to figure out a way to take it off and close it, but also not have to damage the pad because you don't want to have big open wound, but I need to have enough skin to close the wound ideally. So in my head, I'm trying to work out all possible scenarios, which unfortunately includes do I need to remove this toe to get the best outcome and the quickest outcome for Freya, which obviously I don't want to do, but I've got, I'm, you know, at this moment, I'm thinking of all the options. But I won't really be able to fully figure this out until it's all clipped and shaved and, you know, when she's fully ready to go. Right. I'll put some local in. I've had to, like, shave on the top as well. Like, I don't know what skin I'm going to... What are you going to have left? Louise is now starting to doubt if she'll be able to remove the nasty lump from Freya's foot and save the young spaniel's toe. You could actually remove the toe, which sounds really um, drastic, but sometimes for that particular pet it's the right thing because it's actually the quickest way that they return to normal life, but I don't want to make this dog's life worse. It's a bit of a tricky growth. It's kind of all the way around the toe, so I'll have to be moving the toe in between. Louisa finally has a plan and is about to start the tricky surgery to remove the awkward lump on Freya's foot. It's pretty nasty, isn't it? It's a bit gross. I really, really don't want to just lose the toe, but it actually goes like quite deep under the skin and tracks up a little bit. Right, we're just going to have to go. You will not want to walk with this between your toes. Huh. So my plan is I'm going to try and take it all off and see what I'm left with. And if at all during this I think that I'm going to make Freya worse by leaving a wound that might not heal or require lots and lots of bandage changes, then it might be that I have to rethink my option and that unfortunately might be having to remove her toe, which I really don't want to do. Just trying to separate it from the pad to start with to see how much of the pad is involved. I'm going round it as close as I can do to figure out how far it goes in and then I'll try and figure out how to close it after this. Oh, 
I'm almost about to take it off now. It looks like I'm going to be able to remove it all and stitch it back together whilst saving the pad and saving the toe, which is the most important thing. So I'm really pleased. So that's it off. It's actually come off quite nice. But what I need to just try and make sure is that I'm not leaving any of the growth behind because that's unfortunate how sometimes they grow back. Is she okay? So it's starting to look much nicer than it did before. Not that Freya can see it. Just the last stitch and then we'll get it clean. Good, all done. It will be an anxious wait to see if the lump is cancerous and how well Freya walks on her reconstructed paw. As soon as she wakes up, we'll get home, which is exciting. Four hours later, Freya is fully awake after her foot surgery. Normally, our pets recover in their kennels. Freya doesn't really like being in the kennel, so she's been taken out. She's been in the prep area, she's been in the dispensary, she's been in the staff room being looked after, so she's been spoiled rotten. The great news is Freya's walking perfectly normally after Louisa removed the large lump from her hind paw. Freya's devoted mum, Jackie, is keen to see her precious girl. Oh, I'm really excited to see Frey Frey. She's such a sweetie and I can hear her, so she's clearly all right. Look who's coming! Yes! She sailed through it. She's been absolutely fantastic. Much better. She'll be glad to get her in. I think she missed you. Oh, you missed her. I missed her. She just would have been a bit annoyed. It's really nice to reunite her with Jackie because I know how much Freya means to Jackie. We're going to be waiting for the biopsy results. And fingers crossed the biopsy comes back that everything was benign. Yeah. And hopefully it comes back that we've got it all. Right. We've got a bit of a soft spot for Freya, so I feel like Freya deserved the top dog bandana today. So it's a nice little gesture to go home with. You've got your top dog. You've got your top dog bandana. She's been spoiled. She's ready to go home now. Yes. Just wants to go back. <laughs> Come on. Freya, it's home time. Just go. Lovely. We'll see you later. Yeah, thanks for Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks very much. You're welcome. See you later. Come on, Freya. Good girl. Test results on the lump Louisa removed from 12 year old Miko showed the growth was cancerous. Thankfully, they also confirmed that all the malignant tissue was successfully cut off. The friendly Springer Spaniel is back at the beach with her best friend and surfer mum, Ali, as both make the most of Miko's new lease on life. Good girl, there we go, good girl. A week after surgery on her tongue, Nala is pain-free and eating normally. Becca and Louisa are continuing to carefully monitor the seven-year-old's progress. Hopefully the chewing disorder is now a thing of the past. And after Freya's surgery, test results revealed the nasty looking lump taken from her paw was not cancerous. The lively two-year-old is back to full health and enjoying life to the full.